think I'd have to get on it. Good evening and welcome. I'm going to call um, the meeting to order at 7.12 p.m. Welcome to PBOSD board meeting. We have translation in Spanish if you need that support. Please see Urania Lopez. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta Directiva de PBOSD. Desponemos de traducción en español. Si necesita es apoyo, consulta Urania Lopez. This meeting will be live streamed and recorded. If someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, they must complete a speaker card and submit it to Eva Renteria prior to the agenda item. Once an item has begun, cards will not be accepted for that item. Each speaker will have two minutes with the total time for public input on each agenda item to a maximum of 30 minutes. Now I will move us to 3.2, the, <clears throat> the Pledge of Allegiance. I will ask Trustee DeSerpa to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the flag of the one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Now I will move us to item 3.3, .3, the superintendent comments um, by our superintendent of PBUSD schools, Dr. Heather Contreras, will now make a few comments. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to our board meeting this evening. I want to start by complimenting the board. Uh, this weekend, we had a board workshop on Saturday. We had work that we did with a consultant setting our unity of purpose and our core values. It was a great day for me personally, and I want to thank the board for their vision in um, holding that workshop and setting about building a very strong and highly effective board governance team. So thank you. Uh, I also want to announce that we are listening to the public. We've heard at board meetings the request for some of our facilities to be open for use, especially during the summer. So we are trying a pilot program, and we announced to our community just yesterday that we are opening the tennis courts at Aptos High School, the tennis courts at Watsonville High School, the park at McQuitty, um, and the park at Radcliffe, I believe, trying to look at centralized areas so that our community can enjoy our spaces um, during the summer months. All of those facilities will be open from dawn until dusk and on weekends as well. So we're really excited about that. Um, and then we'll notice a lot of admin in the room. This is our summer months, but I want to give a big shout out to our administrators who continue working very hard through the summer, planning for wrapping up one, wrapping up the school year, but also planning for an excellent opening of schools. So um, thank you to our administrators, as well as to our classified staff who we have here supporting us through the summer months with tech support um, and other mechanisms like Eva, who's working hard over here all the time to support us. So I have great gratitude for our PVUSD staff. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. And I will now move us to item 3.4, Governing Board Comments, Reports on Standing Committee Meetings. This is the opportunity for each board member to make a few comments, and we will start with Trustee Bolano Scow. Thank you very much, President Acosta. Welcome, everybody, to the meeting. Hello to everybody watching the meeting. Uh, just a couple of comments. Just want to thank Superintendent Contreras for doing a great job uh, on a variety of ways. Um, helping uh, better our district, bring the district together, really leading with integrity. So thank you, Superintendent, Superintendent Contreras. I wanna thank um, Jim Bruno, everybody expanded learning, doing a great job with summer school. The vibe in summer school is incredibly positive. What a fun time. I'm having a great time uh, working at the orchestra camp at EA Hall. We have you know, 60, 70 kids, courageous kids, uh, learning new instruments, playing music. They're learning empathy, they're learning grace. They're having a great time and it's really building uh, their sense of self. I attended the Esperanza Community Farms. They had a Father's Day event. It was very well attended, beautiful event, working with PV High, uh, with a, and that's also credit to, uh, um, I'm forgetting her name at the top. My name, uh, Jeannie Aiken, was our food and nutrition director. Yeah, thank you, Jeannie Aiken, doing a great job partnering there 
full of resilience, uh, building kids' uh, uh, ability skills to grow food. And so um, I just want to c congratulate Esperanza Community Farms for a great, great event. Um, it's very, very important, very, very inspiring. Uh, looking forward to tonight's agenda. I think we're going to have a lot of excellent presentations. And I know uh, there's always going to be differences of opinion, but I think we're going to have a lot of unity as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scow. Trustee Kim DeSerpa. Thank you. Um, tonight, I'd like to acknowledge the leadership of Lisa Aguirre, our assistant superintendent. Today, I think, is her last day, and I just want to publicly thank her for the many, many years of service. She started under the tenure of uh, Dorma Baker um, through Michelle Rodriguez and um, was a tiny bit just with Heather at the very end. But we wish her all the best. She doesn't have to drive over the hill anymore, and um, she did a great job for our district, and I'll miss her leadership greatly. So thank you, Lisa. Um, I did attend the board retreat that we had on Saturday um, with Heather to set goals and develop a vision um, for the district, and I want to thank my fellow board members who showed up for that. I thought it was very worthwhile and, um, and a wonderful team-building effort for all of us, so thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Dr. Jennifer Holm. I want to echo uh, Trustee DeSerpa's appreciation for uh, Assistant Superintendent Lisa Aguirre's um, service to the district and, and wish her well on the next chapter of, of her career in life um, and I express my appreciation for her work. Um, I also attended a subcommittee of our Pajaro Valley Education Foundation. We are working on transitioning the tri tiny home project into it being a home and looking at how to actually implement, you know, that what's the best, you know, way to implement the, the district or the in the foundation's goals of, you know, having that serve where it's most needed. Um, so those are great conversations to have. And one of the fun parts about being a trustee who is also a PVUSD parent is getting to see the direct effect of our programming. And so I want to express my appreciation to Jen Bruna and her team for the, the summer programming. You know, I have a, a, a student in the, you know, credit recovery program and watching, you know, him kind of get to the end of his day and somebody who was just like, uh, math. But he's, you know, did his, his summer course and he's like, oh, okay. That is such a victory. I'll take it. <laughs> So it's, uh, and having him have a sense of victory, and it's like, okay, if that's what I'm seeing in my home, I know other students are seeing that. And knowing that that's happening throughout our district and throughout our community, I'm like, so to you and your team, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Holm. I'll now move to Trustee Olivia Flores. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here with us tonight on this beautiful summer night. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to my fellow trustees and to Dr. Contreras and Eva for our workshop that we did this weekend. It was very, um, it was good for us, good team building, good um, information for us to, to look into and dive into together. And I also wanted to give an update. Um, Courtney with City of Watsonville Public Works did update us on the light beacon that will be going in at Kingfisher to provide a safer um, walking route for our children that live um, in that area that attend Landmark Elementary. So hopefully that light beacon will be up and working uh, before the first day of school. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Flores. And <clears throat> Trustee um, Vice President Oscar Soto. Hi, right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I just want to take a moment as well to acknowledge Lisa for her work for the district. I had the pleasure of working beside her um, when I was employed here with the district, and she was one of the few people that was uh, pretty strong and supportive in decision making for things that needed to happen at, at sites. So I want to thank her for that. I mean, she's a she was a real go getter. Um, she'll be missed, and I wish her luck in her new endeavors. And uh, thank you, Lisa, for uh, all your help. And it's been a pleasure to, to know you as well. Uh, I, too, attended the uh, workshop this weekend with my fellow trustees. And it was a great experience to see a new perspective of my colleagues that are sitting to the left and the right of me. I think we, um, 
we have our differences, but they're not so different after all. If you start to uh, whittle that piece of wood down, well, we all have the uh, same vision. Um, I was asked what my greatest attribute, attribute would be being here, and my statement was hiring Dr. Contreras and being part of that decision. Um, I think she's going to be, or is, probably the uh, best decision we've made as a board in bringing this district into the direction that it needs to be headed. So thank you, Heather, for all your work, and I wish you luck as well. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Vice President Soto. Um, and so um, I um, attended the intergovernmental um, committee with also Dr. Contreras. There were several things that we spoke about in there, including our joint use agreements, traffic safety projects around school sites, our Mellow Center JPA, um, as well as the banners and the communication collaboration that um, PVUSD has built with the city of Watsonville and vice versa over the years, which has been very instrumental, especially experiencing what we've experienced in the past years with the floods. Um, we also discussed traffic safety issue concerns around um, the towers um, that we're going to continue to work on um, with our um, county staff and county officials, hopefully to get those addressed um, for those concerns. Um, I also want to echo the same sentiments many of my colleagues have already expressed about thanking every one of you for showing up this weekend and giving up your time on your weekend from your families and um, your days off to come to the board governance workshop. It was a really um, great experience for the board, as, um, and I think that there is a lot of productivity that will be coming out of that for the future um, to set direction for the school district. Um, so I am super, super excited about that and seeing what that will be in fruition coming forward. Um, also, I know that many of our staff will be going on summer break after this evening <laughs> um, before our next board meeting. Um, so I just want to wish all those that are going to, our 12-month employees that are going to be going on summer break and taking advantage of this time, a very happy summer break and do enjoy it. And also to also recognize our maintenance options facility staff once again, because sadly many of them will not be going on vacation because this is the, probably the highest time busiest for their season um, of the year when they're not dealing with floods in the winter. Um, so again... Thank you to all of our staff, and I wish those that are going on break um, a very wonderful summer break until we see you again. And to our MNO staff, I, I wish you um, good speed forward. So um, that is the end of governing board comments. Um, now I'm going to move to the um, approval of the agenda, item 4.1. Uh, the board is going to have to re reconvene to closed session, so we will need to move the report out of closed session to after we have returned from reconvening to closed session, which will be after item 13.1. Um, staff is also requesting that item 11.5 be moved to before item 11.4. So I will make a motion to approve the agenda with moving report out of closed session to after item 13.1 reconvene to closed session and item 11.5 to be moved to before item 11.4. Can I have a second for that? I'll second. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Any discussion? Questions? Okay. Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposing? Any abstaining? That will carry on a 6-0-1. Thank you. Next, I will move us to item 5.1, approval of the May 22nd, 24 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Make a motion to approve. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Can I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. I have a first and a second. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any um, objecting? Any abstaining? That will carry on a 6-0-1. We will be de we're deferring 6.1 to after 13.1, so I will now move us to items 7, our consent agenda. 
Um, since we, again, will be reporting out of closed session once we have returned from reconvening to look closed session. So now item seven, consent agenda. These items are routine items that come before the board. Do we have any public speakers to consent agenda? Yes, we do. Let's give us just one second while we cipher through this so we don't miss anyone. Okay, so we have several comments on our consent agenda. We have a item 7.4, 7.8, 7.12, 7.11, 7.14, 7.15, 7.16, 7.20, .20 and 7.21. So I will call on those speakers to come and speak to that now. So on item 7.4, Dr. Barraza. Dr. Barraza, if you have a comment to make, I'd ask you to come to the podium and make that comment so we could hear that for the public record and have that read in. We don't have your mic on your mic. Is it on? Okay. Again, your comments right now can only be to the item 7.4, 7.8, 7.11, or 7.21. You're going to talk about it, right? So when you talk about it, then I can come and talk about each, each item. I don't know what you're going to say, so I don't know if I have a comment on that. So how can I comment on something that I know is going to be say, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm sorry that I haven't developed that skill yet. So these are consent agenda items which are routinely brought before the board. Mm -hmm. They are, unless a board member chooses to remove an item from the consent agenda, they are voted on in a collective. So, so you don't discuss them? Unless a board member chooses to pull something, no. So then I have to read every consent item before I come here? Yes. That's insane. You know how long your agenda is? It took me yes, over an hour to read just the budget, Would which you? I had an issue with because I'm wondering why are we paying $5,000 for somebody's airline tickets? Again, so would you like to comment on these items? Because now would be your time. I can't comment. The only one I have a comment on is why we're paying airline tickets for somebody. I'm That's not sure which know. one that is. So do you want to elaborate? Did you not look at the budget? It's in, the, it's in one of the budget sheets. I don't remember your agenda. Are you talking is about... Again, I'm not going to get into a back and forth with you here. With regards to the cards that you put on for consent agenda, do you have any comments on those items at this point? Based on the little that I was able to see, because again, your agenda is super lengthy and we don't all have time to look at it. I don't know what you guys are going to discuss. If you're just going to vote on it, then my only question is, why are we spending $5,000 for somebody's airline tickets? So again, um, if you don't have a comment on the that items was my you comment. put in. Did you not understand my comment? My comment is I want to know why we're spending $5,000 on somebody's airline tickets. That's what I got a chance to see. Because again, your agenda is super lengthy. We don't get it printed until we show up at 7. Okay. And you want me to read it by, before 7 so that I can make that that. Uh, that comment, you don't put it in there the day before, you put it in, you, you leave the agenda there a little bit before. I don't have time to go through all of it and be able to comment. I hope you understand that what you're asking is a, is, is a ridiculous ask. Okay, Dr. Braza, so again, I'll repeat, these are consent agenda items that are routine items that come before the board. If you do not wish to... And I repeat, my comment okay. is why are we spending $5,000 on if you do not, tickets? If you do not wish to speak to them, we're going to move forward. I did. For going I did speak your, to it. For I going don't your have comment. It off the top of my head, because I did. Uh, I I only had 
an hour and a half to read through this stuff. So I, my comment is, why are we spending $5,000 on somebody's airline ticket? And we can engage in this dialogue back and forth. So if a board member chooses to move something, you're foregoing at this point your choice to make a public comment other than what you've said. If a board member chooses to remove an item, there may be opportunity to speak to it. Other than that, there's not. And the agenda has been posted since Friday at 6 p.m. Okay? okay? So thank so, you. We're moving on. So then, so then my comment is there's a, there's a lot of lack. Okay, so now we are moving on to item 7.12. Chris Webb, do you have any public comment on item 7.12, Mr. Webb? Uh, good evening. Uh, so on the one of the things it says on this item is that the plan's been reviewed, proposed expenditures of funds allocated through the consolidated application by the school site council. So at the last site council, at least for Renaissance, um, I had a question about like what's what's the status of our Measure L funds and like that and the like I said like as we're aware the staff room has already been completed, so I felt like that was that should be known and so no nobody in the community got that that info and. I think we need to look at that. Other thing is like historically we've had higher attendance at those uh, meetings and I think we need to look at um, outreach that we're doing to make sure like are we really getting stakeholders involved. Also um, I think Dr. Rodriguez did good with um, the wellness center and I hope that gets approved. I saw 7.5 and uh, I support Claudia getting more training but also I want to say I supported her when she brought CRE. And um, I think it's like a little inconsistent to have her, but then we said no to CRE. Yep. But she is good, so you should keep her and keep training her, but everyone should get that CRE training. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Webb. Okay, so that is the end of our public speakers to consent agenda. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. Um, I'd like to defer 7.20 and 7.21. Thank you. 7.20 and 7.21. Is there anything else? Anyone else? Okay, Trustee DeSerpa, would you like to make a motion to that effect? I'll make a motion to defer 7.20 and 7.21. While approving the remaining items? As well as approving the remaining items. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Can I have a second? second. I have a first, I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. And now going to deferred, we do have public comment for deferred. Dr. Barraza. Well, since you don't want to listen to me, I'll skip it. Seeing that Dr. Barraza has forego her opportunity for public comment on Item eight, I will bring it now to item 7.20, deferred by Trustee DeSerpa, approved notice of award for the feasibility study for future development of new maintenance and operations facility. I take it we're gonna have our Director of Maintenance Ops and Facilities come up? Either that or the CBO, one or the other. Or the CBO, and or, I think we have them both in-house. In Thank you, Trustee you DeSerpa, do you want to go with your questions? Thank you. In a couple, okay. Um, so I see we're, we are hoping to enter into a contract for a feasibility study for future development of a new maintenance and operations facility. My question is, I'm, I don't remember budgeting $22,000 for this. So if somebody could explain to me where this money is coming from, normally, Normally in the backup, it says where the money is coming from. So I'd like to know on this, on this item where we're getting $22,000 to perform a feasibility study. And, and um, if it is deemed feasible, where's the money coming from to develop the new center? Yes, yeah, so for 7.20 for the feasibility study for the maintenance and operations facility, we have designated one-time uh, RDA funds out of Fund 25. 
um, for this feasibility study for 7.20 and then also for 7.21. And can you speak to the need about why this would be an important thing? Yeah, so as part of the initial strategic planning meeting that we did around um, looking at some of the need, needs coming up for the bond, we felt that um, it would be a good idea to start looking at uh, feasibility around uh, when we're doing some new construction around different um, uh, property that the district owns so that we can hit the ground running um, come November. So what would happen is in November, um, uh, hopefully the bond goes through and at that point, um, the initial planning fees, um, we would be able to um, uh, count that towards uh, the project cost, the soft costs. So can, um, do you have something you wanna add? Okay. Um, so a feasibility study, would, I understand what that means, but will there be plans, DSA, anything going up to DSA in advance of potentially passing the bond or no? So, so at this time, we're just uh, doing the feasibility studies. Um, we're looking into making our facilities bigger in our maintenance yard. Um, we are really tight in there with space. Um, we do need a lot more people in there and a lot of trucks so and equipment we don't really have the storage for our equipment and our trucks there so we are just doing the feasibility study right now and it hopes to passing the bond in the future and really adding to our maintenance department and at that time i think we will go out to dsa just because we would like to go up in our maintenance department and that's gonna require a DSA approval because of the space is really confined and really tight in there that we will have to build up so like we could two, have in the bottom. two or three stories or Correct. something. Correct. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And the initial thought was with um, the demands of a $315 million bond on the maintenance and operations department that um, we really need to kind of look at the facilities um, and the workspaces that they have available right now, which were deemed um, at the time of when Measure L passed as being really insufficient at that time. So looking at kind of um, all the projects that they're able to maintain during Measure L and with ESSER and Paro Middle School, um, it was a struggle um, with the workspaces that they had um, and the crew that they really need to maintain. So going into uh, possibly the new bond measure, um, really kind of starting off making sure that MNO has all the resources that they need to facilitate the next 10 plus years of future bond projects. Great, thank you for that thank explanation. You. Thank you. Trustee Serpa, are you satisfied with your, would you like to make a motion to approve that item? Make a motion to approve. I have a motion to approve that item. Can I have a second? I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Moving on to item 7.21. Thank you. So I have similar questions about 7.21. Because that's a bigger ticket item. I think it's $93,000, something like that. So I'm yes, hoping you can uh, with, elaborate about why we would need to do that and where that money's coming from. Yes, with the workforce housing, because we knew right off the bat that this was going to be a top priority for the board and administration um, for the bond. Um, with the workforce housing, um, because we have to evaluate our existing spaces and see if you know we have to go through um, the Coastal Commission or um, go through a CEQA process. So because we were hearing um, just through board, uh, kind of board direction that we really want to hit the ground running with some of these bigger projects, um, because with a lot of these projects also, the further out you go, um, we are losing really dollars due to inflation, um, rising costs for construction and planning. So getting some of these plans uh, laid out over the summer. Um, that way we can come back to the board um, in the fall and really give more information about the workforce housing, how much it's going to cost, what are some viable um, areas that we could start laying out some groundwork. So that was the thought behind getting this process started early. And this was using one-time RDA funds out of Fund 25. Okay, so we can afford to do this? Yes. Okay, because I hate to 
spend money if we, the bond doesn't pass and if we don't get campaigning on that bond soon it's you're not going to have the support that we need so we need to get out there and start campaigning it and um, um, with that I'll make a motion to approve second thank you trustee de Serpin. thank you trustee Bolanosco I have a first and a second all those in favor aye any opposed any abstaining that will carry 601 thank you now we will move to item nine for visitor non-agenda items. Um, for public comment, this is an opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Please know that the Brown Act prohibits the board from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items and, how, and we are listening. Each speaker will have two minutes with a total time for public comment to a max of 30 minutes. Do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. We have 11 tonight. And I'll call the first six up. It'll be two minutes. You're welcome. Marilyn Garrett, Chris Webb, Bobby Peltz, Dr. Barasa, Max Barasa, Christine Hong, Eli Davies, and Bill Beecher. Oh, here. I'm mechanically challenged. Um, since COVID shots have been imposed on people, it's important to know some facts. This is from Wise Traditions publication, Winter 2023, COVID jabs is titled. The bad news about COVID shots just keeps accumulated. In the United Kingdom, the Office for National Statistics published an update on deaths by vaccination status in England, which revealed that the vaccinated population accounted for 95% of the COVID-19 deaths during 12 months, months from June 22 to May 2023. 94% of the deaths were among either the triple or quadruple vaccinated population, while the unvaccinated accounted for the lowest number of COVID deaths in every single month. This is from exposenews.com. And it's not just COVID that is carrying off the vaccinated. Physicians are describing a surge in aggressive rapid onset cancers following the rollout of the shots, and the sources are cited here. I want to recommend a book and have you invite this local author to speak. The book is very well documented called The Unfortunate Truth About Vaccines, Exposing the Vaccine Orthodoxy by Leon Canarod. The second edition is just off the press and you can get it Amazon as well. The truth must be known. Vaccines are dangerous and poisonous. Thank you. Uh, actually, I wanted to speak to the Youth Truth Survey results that were reported like two meetings ago. Um, so like one, two like areas of growth that I observed were um, one is about safety and then the other one was about relationships and and both those matched my feelings um, reflecting on my time at Renaissance and and specifically the changes that have been put to that site post COVID. So number one is like losing the, the normal progress monitoring system. Um, and then another one was the lack of like variable credits which, which like basically led to more inflation in credits and that led to less um, willingness of students to like have to perform academically. And then that leads to other uh, activities that are not the best. Um, also with the relationships part, there's been this complete disregard for the role of academic advisors. And I feel like that's a huge um, like lost asset and um, it totally speaks to like the relationship thing. Um, like if you don't care about your, if, it, if that relationship didn't matter, like no wonder kids are uh, feeling that. Also, um, 
I wanted to also just say like the board policy or ed code 35145.5 hasn't changed. It still says that people can submit comments during an item. So I feel like we're kind of straying from legislative intent, um, board president. And also um, I just wanted to say that uh, because I, because of the changes that, and, and, and concerns for my own safety, um, like there was a knife in my tire at the beginning or at the end of last year, there was gun brought to school renaissance this, earlier this year. Uh, I, I have decided to go to Watsonville High and I think you have a great principal there, caring guy who values the institutions. And if I'm allowed to be a caring teacher, I'll go there. Thank you. Uh, Bobby Pelt, Watsonville High. I am here again to speak uh, on the CRE contract. Um, Superintendent Contreras, at the last board meeting, you announced that a committee has been formed to determine the next step options for training teachers and administrators in ethnic studies. While I appreciate that sentiment, we did that already. CRE was originally recommended by a committee of trustees and district administrators and community members. This diverse group included the beloved Willie Yahiro, the founder of Digital Nest, Jacob Martinez, and internationally renowned professor, Christine Schleter. They did their homework, and they recommended Dr. Allison Santiago Cubales because she's a highly regarded, well-respected, award-winning professor of ethnic studies. They do not come any better. Superintendent Contreras, we don't need any more committees. CRE was the best option then, it's the best option now. Yep. And our kids deserve the best. Yep. Support ethnic studies, bring back CRE. And I'll be part of that committee, thank you. Good evening board. I am Maximiano Barras Hernandez, and recently I've been participating in the Student Trustee Academy hosted by the Santa Cruz COE. Yesterday, we read a report, which was sent to you last year by Dr. Sabaha, regarding student participation during school board meetings. One finding that I found upsetting is that adult responses to student voices were less valued compared to adult voices. Unfortunately, this has been my experience with this board, and in particular with President Acosta and Vice President Soto, who have been ignoring our voices for the last seven months since my time being involved in the fight for CIE. You have only shown that you would rather try to silence us and intimidate us instead of listening to us. You claim you want student participation, but yet you have shown that you don't value our voices. How do you expect students to want to participate in this supposed democratic process when your actions make it clear that you don't care about our voices? Thank you. Tonight, I would like to read from President Acosta's failed state assembly campaign website. It reads, I will fully fund quality educational programs that have, proven, that have a proven track record for success for our kids. CRE is that proven contract that has supported that. As a trustee, you have failed our kids in this area. Ethnic studies classes have been shown to increase academics, attendance, self-esteem, college acceptance, and, graduate, and graduation rates. And these are good ethnic studies classes, not the watered ones down that some of the conservatives in the community have been talking about. Ones that actually teach real ethnic studies, like the ones that Dr. Tintiango Cubales has brought in. Yet, you're blocking the continued success of these great classes as a result of your own personal agenda. You also said, every election year, we get the same politicians over and over again. You know these politicians. Once elected to office, they take care of themselves, their relatives, special interests that donate big money. We, the people, are often left alone to beg for help that seldom materializes. Boy, have you illustrated that very well. You have sat there with your own personal agenda, not once telling us why CRE has not been back. To me, that's your, that's your own personal agenda. You listen to two people who came with their own personal special interest, and that's who you've listened to, not the community, at, uh, the greater community who has come consistently to tell you otherwise. So you have become that politician you claim you weren't gonna be. 
You have exemplified it. You have ignored we the people for months and shown that you are exactly the type of politician who will take care of herself and special interests. All we have gotten from you is the silent treatment, failed intimidation tactics, and complete lack of transparency. And I mean complete lack of transparency because we, to this day, do not know why you refuse to put it back on the agenda. This is why we will work hard to replace you with somebody who will actually listen to the people. I see why you try to take that extra minute from us. Good evening, board, Dr. Contreras. I'm Eli. I use they, them pronouns. I am here once again to speak on the CRE contract. Over 160 members of the community have written in support of CRE, and well over 50, well over 50, have come in person to these meetings. Only three members of the public have opposed it. Yet those same three people have attempted to paint supporters of CRE as a small fringe group. I reject that attempted reframe of the reality that I have seen in these board meetings. What should be a simple decision of listening to your community who's most impacted has turned into a months long campaign of students coming here to bravely and with vulnerability advocate for their education. CRE was vetted before the decision to move forward with them three years ago. Numerous ethnic studies professors have come to speak to the good value of CRE as an ethnic studies consultant. The funding is there. The supposed controversy and the insult to Dr. Tintiango Kubales has never been addressed. And yet this board says there is a special committee being formed to look into the ethnic studies program at PVSD. There has been no transparency from this board. You reject continually putting the CRE contract on the agenda and provide no reason. So yes, the community is frustrated. And sweeping the slander against Dr. Tintiango Kubales under the rug by sidestepping CRE entirely is wrong and a betrayal of a former partner and colleague who put so much heart into this district's ethnic studies program. So thanks for the extra minute, but you need to announce the accurate number on your website for how much time the public has to speak. Reducing our time to one minute as a means of control, a bureaucratic punishment against us is something I expect from the leadership of this board, but I have seen many people who came here for acute personal concerns, had the impression they had two minutes, face unexpected disappointment, and that is not fair to the public. So be transparent with what you're doing, especially ahead of time. Thank you. Superintendent, you recently joined this district, yet those of us who are part of this community are very close to being at our wits end. We have come here for many, many months. I want to say a few things to you. One is that when people first fought for ethnic studies, they did so under the rubric of third world. Why? Because they didn't view themselves as a national minority. They saw themselves in empowered terms as part of a global majority. Back then in the 1960s, 80% of the K through 12 um, population was white. Right now, nearly 80% of the school going population in the state of California are students of color. It's exactly reversed. The time is ripe for there to be an ethnic studies curriculum that serves the people. And this moment of ethnic studies expansion is a profound moment of danger, including co-optation. There are two people who came to this board. One of them publicly said on the record that he doesn't agree with 99% of this community. He put himself in the 1%. He was listened to. I want you to understand, there is no compromise between ethnic studies, which is what community responsive education is. It responds to the community and non-ethnic studies for the 1%. Okay, there's no compromise between these two. I want to say something to you, Kim. We don't know each other, but I actually heard from so many people how disappointed they were in you. I hope over these many months, you've had the time and the wherewithal to rethink your rash action, which was profoundly undemocratic and didn't serve the people of this district.
Good evening. Let's change the pace. I want to talk about what we learned from COVID-19 and what happened in this district. This is the math results that show during COVID 2020-21, our math scores jumped way up. After COVID, they went way back down. Next slide, here's your English language arts. Same thing happened that during the COVID, we had spectacular results. There's two takeaways. PVUSD jumped up during COVID-19 and all the local unified districts and the state fell below the pre-pandemic levels and then afterwards. So what was different? PVUSD used Google Classrooms and a well-prepared lesson plan that was put online. That was the difference. So I have a proposal. We have math teacher problems. We don't have enough of them, and then there's the quality of the teachers. So for 24 and 25, I propose that we use the COVID-19 in the classroom to teach math. That would jump our scores up because we already have a proven plan. Secondly, oh, this is the wrong slide. Well, it's okay. I'll, in addition, we have over 4,000 students in the after-school program for our elementary schools. They're there. They need help. Why don't we use this same COVID-19 learning experience after school, because we have trouble trying to be able to tutor our students after school, use this same CAN program in the classroom to help these students improve themselves. So thank you for your time. All right, last three speakers, Mark Mendoza, Itzel Barraza, and Gabriel Barraza. Good evening, Board of Trustees. I want to start by thanking Trustee Adam Scow for joining our community in celebrating Dia de Esperanza. Me and my colleagues are very thankful you were there. I also want to acknowledge Farms to Cafeteria program by Esperanza Community Farms. Me and my colleagues and Esperanza Community Farms members have been working hard to provide organic salads to summer high school students and that's something that should be acknowledged. The work that Esperanza Community Farms has helped me meet new people and create community, which is taught in ethnic studies. I fear newer students won't have the opportunity to learn further about community and other important stuff that isn't taught in other classes. Please bring back CRE. Students, community, our district needs this. Bring it to discussion, bring it to the agenda. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yichelle, and I've been here eight times. Uh, I'm attending the Student Trustee Academy, and yesterday we read a study about participation, and it found that students feel ignored by adults and that adults tend to dismiss and minimize student voices. I must admit that I could totally relate to the study because this is exactly how I have felt coming to these meetings. We are the people who have put you in this position that you are now in. Listening to us is the bare minimum. You don't even do that. You sit there looking at your computers, avoiding eye contact, ignoring us. We, ha we are coming to these board meetings because it is important to us that you bring back CRE. You sit there ignoring our voices. You sit there ignoring the people who are trying to better their children's education. You will be voted out if you continue to ignore us. While I might not be able to vote, I can campaign for the people who will replace you, and that is what I intend to do. My name is Gabriel Barraza and I live in Area 5. I am here again to advocate for bringing the CRE contract back to the district. I wanted to point out the lack of transparency and leadership by many of you on this board. We have not heard anything about why the contract was not renewed and why it hasn't even been brought back for discussion and debate. All we have are the lies on which the arbitrary decision not to renew the contract was made. If we cannot trust you with transparency and leadership on this one issue that costs the district no money, how can we trust you with a $315 million bond measure? At this point, it's doubtful that we can. Trustee Soto talked about the right direction for the district, 
<laughs> but we don't know what most of you think is the right direction because you don't answer emails. You don't have meetings with us. You make no public statements at all that tell, the, tell us what your intentions are for this district. We don't know what you guys even see as the right district, right position or direction for this district to go in. Until we have that, we're gonna keep working against you guys and try to replace some of you in the coming election and get people that actually listen to the community and have the best interests of the students at heart. Thank you. Do we have any further public comment? That is all. Okay, thank you all. We will now move to item 10, employee organization comments. Now is the time that we hear from our employee organizations. Each will have five minutes. We will start with item 10.1, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, PVFT. Do we have anyone here? Um, good evening to the board, Dr. Concharis, everybody here in person, watching online on this uh, gorgeous summer day. We've had some really beautiful days lately. Uh, my name is Brandon Denise, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, I'm currently our grievance officer for the next four days, um, and then I will be assuming the role of chief negotiator. So that's exciting. Uh, um, we all know that many of us are enjoying our summer break, um, but I do want to take a second to shout out a group that was left out of an earlier shout out of those teachers teaching summer school because they are part of the program as well and I know slip ups happen but I, I wanted to take a second to really shout them out. I've heard from our members that these days are really fast paced like there's no like oh it's summer let's just kick back like the kids want to learn, they want to have activities, they're engaged, it's moving really fast, um, it's a lot of fun, and it's a lot of work. Um, our students are gaining from this, they're learning, and they're being enriched. So shout out to all the members who are there working summer school. We hope that going into this school year, we can work collaboratively to ensure that labor is involved and at the table when programmatic changes are being discussed and decided. As a union, our experience last year was not one where we felt like partners, but more like an afterthought. I know we've had many key positions filled by an interim employee, um, but this district has a history of unilateral decision making and taking a conciliatory approach to labor management issues, and we hope to have a more open and symbiotic relationship going forward. Um, I think that the work Dr. Contreras has done to get out into the community and into our school sites to look, listen, and learn is of vast importance. Um, and now we're looking forward to the concrete actions that will benefit our students. Even though it is summer break and I'm spending a lot of my time at the beach, um, the union does not just go away. We are still here, we are paying attention, and we want to see the new leadership in this district work to repair the relationship between management and the union. I have some thoughts on how we can get to work repairing that relationship. Um, I'm gonna share those. For the most part, I'll just be here listening. Um, some of my thoughts are, one, we're really looking forward to getting Jenny M as the CBO and doing some important work together. Um, in the past, we've had CBOs who look at our students and staff as numbers on a spreadsheet um, and who weren't even present during negotiations. Like, we're there at the table and we're like, where's our CBO? Oh, they're in their office twiddling their thumbs. And it's like, we're negotiating at the table, get down here. So we're looking forward to having someone who is worthy of our respect in that position and we know that we'll be honest and we can work collaboratively. Even though in negotiations there's a lot of back and forth and you don't always agree on everything, I look forward to being able to have a relationship built on respect and rapport. Um, we've had members retaliated against and pitted against the union by some very high level employees in this district. We're calling on that to stop. We cannot have key decision makers who shy away from the decisions they make and then cast them as the fault of the union. Or in meetings with certain members, we'll be talking about other members who aren't in that meeting, bad-mouthing them to their colleagues. It discourages um, membership in the union. It is an unfair labor practice, and we've submitted that complaint. Um, we have one of our secondary sites where the class of freshman seminar is just being assigned to the entire CTE department. This is unfair, 
ill-advised, and it's disrespectful to their credentials and qualifications of these employees. I know that creating a master schedule is not easy. It's ridiculously challenging. One domino falls and it impacts all the others. Um, but we really encourage you to get out to Pajaro Valley High School, listen to the impacted teachers there, and work with that leadership to move in a new direction because it cannot move in the direction that it has been moving in. That leadership is toxic. Um, lastly, we would greatly appreciate it if we can agree on a settlement for our personal necessity days and arbitration. We are quickly moving towards a deadline where now we're going to have to file an extension and it's just ridiculous. It should have never happened and we should really resolve this issue. It's a waste of funds. It's an unfair labor practice and it's disrespectful to our members. So we're hoping to see that decision come to a closed session agenda. Really disappointed it wasn't today, but we're really looking forward to coming together on a resolution of that settlement. Look at that. Five minutes. Um, and on a positive thought, I have one here somewhere, just really working towards the collaborative relationship and a start to a successful school year. Thank you, Brendan. That to item 10.2, California School Employees Association, CSCA. Do we have anyone here? Seeing none, I will now move us to 10.4, CWA, Communication Workers of America. This is our substitutes teachers. Anyone here? Seeing none, I will now move us, um, I'm sorry, to I, I flip to those, 10.3, um, uh, Pavam, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. Do we have anyone here? Sorry about the flip-flop. Good evening, President Acosta, Superintendent Dr. Contreras, Board of Trustees, Cabinet, and our community. We are honored to be here tonight representing our colleagues in the Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. It is summer in PVUSD, and we are so proud of the work of our students, our staff, and our leaders in our summer school programs. There is joy happening on those campuses. They are having so much darn fun, so much learning, and so much hope is evident. And so we're really grateful for the work of our expanded learning uh, department leaders, as well as the teachers and everyone who's supporting the work that's happening. And we're looking forward to the, all the fun they're going to have in the camps and all kinds of exciting things they're going to do in July. Tonight, we want to acknowledge and celebrate the work of our assistant superintendent, Lisa Aguirre, who worked her last day today in PVUSD. We're grateful for Lisa's continued and courageous commitment to the students and families of PVUSD. Uh, good evening. My name is Rich Moran. Um, I had the opportunity to share my gratitude with Ms. Aguirre personally. And um, as an assistant superintendent, there's a number of things that you do. Um, but something that I got to share with her personally was the fact that as site leaders, in order to do our best work, um, we often look to our leaders for support, advice, and sometimes direction. And knowing that our texts, our emails, our calls will be responded to immediately, because we only do that when it's important, um, gives us a sense of calm and allows us to do our best work for our students, for our staff, and for our community. So amongst the myriad of other things that Lisa has done in her very different positions here in PVUSD, um, that is something I have greatly appreciated about her practice, her level of professionalism. And it was that level of professionalism that allowed me and my colleagues to do our best work for our student, staff, and community. So I have to come to my little email now, sorry. The auto lock. Um, so over the past 10 years, Lisa served our students, staff, and families in elementary education, curriculum and instruction, and secondary education. Her boundless energy inspired our community, our students, and our staff. So we wanted to say thank you to Ms. Aguirre. Thank you for your time and for listening. Thank you both. <clears throat> I will now move us to um, 11 action items. We will now move to 11.1, .1, the 2022-2023 Annual Independent Autumn. This report will be presented by our Director of Fiscal Service and our Interim CBO, um, Ms. Jenny M, as well as Joe Escobar with the Senior Manager at Eid Bailey LLP. Thank you. Good evening, President Acosta, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Dr. Contreras. My name is Jenny M. And I am here with uh, Mr. Joe Escobar, the senior partner with Eat Bailey. Um, we are here to present our 
independent audit report for uh, your review and approval. Um, so before um, I invite uh, Mr. Escobar to come uh, speak about um, uh, his uh, review and audit of our district, um, I wanted to um, just point out um, in the summary, um, in front of you, you have the audit booklet. And for our financial statements, we received um, an unmodified opinion on financial statements. And Mr. Escobar will talk a little bit more about what that means. Federal compliance, we received unmodified opinion. And for state compliance, we received uh, two findings, um, but unmodified opinion on the remainder of our state programs. So I will now um, invite Mr. Escobar to speak about the audit report. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for having me this evening. Included in this agenda is the 2023 fiscal year financial statements for the district. <clears throat> the financial statements contain our report, opinions, and the financial statements of the district. I work closely with Jenny and her team throughout the audit. The district engages with Ide Bailey to provide opinions on the fair and reasonable presentation of the financial statements, provide a report on the compliance in accordance with government audit standards, a report on compliance for each major federal program, and on internal control over compliance required by uniform guidance, and an opinion on state compliance. <clears throat> Auditors have the responsibility of expressing opinions based on the audit evidence reviewed and the presentation of the financial statements, as well as with respect to compliance when reviewing related materials. Furthermore, Auditors have a requirement to act ethically and evaluate any impairment to independence and appropriately disclose any such matters to all appropriate persons. Management has a responsibility to provide complete and accurate financial amounts and data to be included in the annual financial report, as well as maintaining, designing, and implementing effective internal controls over financial reporting and compliance with said laws and regulations. We performed sufficient audit procedures to support our assertions to the best of our knowledge and capabilities. Audit standards require that we communicate specific matters to the board. In performance of our audit, we provided the district with an unmodified or clean, sorry, an unmodified or clean opinion on the financial statements to be included with their presentation. We noted no material misstatements in performance of our audit procedures, no uncorrected no, sorry, actually, uh, no uh, uncorrected material misstatements, no significant deficiencies came to our attention in performance of our audit. As well, we did not note any instances of noncompliance as it relates to the financial statements presentation or federal rewards. <clears throat> we did note two matters of noncompliance as it relates to state requirements. As detailed in the packet provided to the board, what uh, was with respect to the annual sc school accountability report card of which no question cost resulted. Another is related to the unduplicated pupil count of which question cost of the amount of 420,000 has resulted. Through persistence, through persistence, Jenny and her team were able to work uh, the district down and reduce the fi initial finding of about $1.6 million to that amount. We are also required for audit standards to disclose the cumulative immaterial adjustment of about 270000 was passed on in performance of the audit, <clears throat> which would have improved the respective fund balance and net position of the district related to interest and in LCFF receivables. We, as the district's auditors, complied with all relevant ethical requirements. Most specifically, we have remained independent throughout the engagement, consistent with government audits, auditing standards. We do note that the district's financials contain significant accounting estimates as it relates to net pension liabilities and other post-employment benefits. As such, in your review of the financial statements, we believe that footnotes 12 and 14 are the most sensitive disclosures relating to the presentation of these amounts. These disclosures are sensitive accounting estimates affecting the financial statements of the district and are based on the usage of actuarial specialists. 
We evaluated the key factors and assumptions used by the actuary and determined that the estimates are reasonable in relation to the basic financial statements taken as a whole. The district did not find it necessary to consult with any accountants regarding auditing or accounting matters as it relates to the district. No significant difficulties were encountered in performance of our audit procedures or in communications with management throughout the engagement. We did not experience any disagreements with management and performance of the audit. Jenny and her team were helpful throughout the performance of the engagement and assisted us in the completion of a timely and quality audit. This concludes my remarks. Thank you so much, Ms. Escobar. Um, so uh, I respectfully uh, request um, for board uh, review and approval of our 22-23 audit report. Thank you both for your presentation. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. All right, seeing none, I will bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Trustee Flores. Thank you for this presentation and for this lovely book that has been some good reading. Um, and I want to thank your team, Jenny, for that reducing that penalty um, over a over million dollars. So thank you for that hard work and working to complete this audit in the timely manner that it needed to be completed in. Thank you. And I wanted to um, really say thank you to Joe and his team. They um, were very, very collaborative and supportive um, in helping us find some alternative documents. And then just give a special thank you to Jean Eakin and Alfon Alfonso and Food and Nutrition. They were able to go through the direct cert um, system to help reduce that and Brooke Hopkins as well. Thank you to them too. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Trustee Flores. Any others? Trustee DeSerpa. So there have been many years where we've had zero findings um, in our budget audit. So we have findings this year, and I'd like Jenny, maybe to, if you could speak to them about how we are, what the remedy is, and definitely, and what happened and mm -hmm. why. Absolutely. So for the um, the first state finding with the uh, the fit the facility inspection tool, not matching the school accountability report card. Um, this was a finding, uh, a repeat finding um, from the prior year. Um, so part of what the discrepancy is, is um, sometimes we have information from the FIT that doesn't make it onto the SARC because some of the information comes from the county office um, through the Williams report. Some of the information comes through um, uh, facility inspections that we do here at the district. So I believe in 22-23 what happened was for three of the sites, um, three of the FIT um, reports were either revised after the fact um, and, and there was, I believe, a break-in um, update of what was um, uploaded to the SARC. So this year, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of close that gap and implement um, an additional review process at the very end with the SARC. Um, in terms of the second finding with the unduplicated um, people counts, um, I believe right, I believe that is related to just the incredible turnover that we've experienced with uh, leadership, um, both at the say at the district level, office staff. Um, unfortunately, when we have high rates of turnover like that, um, we lose a lot of institutional knowledge and process. So um, when it comes to records retention, it's not always intuitive. So we've used this as a learning opportunity of figuring out how can we bolster our process, the resources that we're providing, um, and how can we um, continually bring this into um, different trainings and meetings so we're keeping it at the forefront of, of um, people's minds. So one of the things when, um, when our systems were changed at the state level, I think, I think it was for LCAP where we had to estimate or um, prove how many students um, qualified for like free and reduced lunch that were living under the poverty line. Um, I didn't think that our district had a great plan for that. I felt like there was money that was left on the table or escaped because we weren't 
um, providing proper documentation or numbers of the kids that were in our district that were needy. Can you, can somebody talk, maybe Heather, you're too new, but can we talk about what that is now and how we could fix this problem so this doesn't happen in the future in terms of each site? Definitely. Um, Forming proper counts. Yeah, so um, this was something that was really interesting. You're absolutely right. When Universal Meals rolled out of um, an unintended consequence that many districts faced of now that families weren't required to fill out the free and reduced meal um, application, um, many districts initially did see a drop. Um, here at PV, I believe over over the years, we've done an amazing job of really educating our families about why that alternative income form is important and how it impacts our funding. Um, it is part of the back to school uh, parent packets. Um, and um, I believe right now we, we have a pretty high return rate on the alternative income form. Okay. And then how are, how can we make sure that like we know how many foster kids and we're you know that we're counting up all of the the subgroups that we need to to get the money that we deserve for them? We don't know. So I'm going to let Claudia um, jump in just because she's a subject matter expert with that. So in terms of foster youth numbers, our student services department keeps track of that, so they're able to come up with the numbers for us. Yvonne, Dr. Alcaraz has systems in place for that. Okay. Okay, I just want to make sure that our district is getting all the money so that we don't have a finding like this in the future. Yes, absolutely. So um, I think as soon as we realized that there was that gap, and a lot of that was just um, the big uh, change in uh, leadership at all levels. So we've implemented a process going forward. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Um, Superintendent Dr. Contreras would like to add a comment, if she can, right now. Yeah, just to speak to that going forward, we'll be making sure that uh, we have strategies and systems in place to make sure that we do capture all of the students and uh, that we're, being, we're collecting what we should to be able to provide the services that they deserve. So that, that will be a definite area of focus as we move forward next year. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Trustee Dr. Holm. Thank you for the presentation. I think in your answers to um, Trustee Acosta's questions, you answered many of, uh, thank you, to Serpa's <laughs> questions. You answered many of my questions about some of the underlying uh, causes and some of the support structures you're putting in place going forward. I just have a couple of other um, follow-up questions. One, I was just curious, because I know, um, you know, what one of the um, sites that was mentioned was, you know, one of our sites that is currently, you know, hosting two school sites. And are, are we thinking that that might have been a factor as well? So I did look into um, whether part of the reason the records were lost was because of the, that transition. Um, and um, those records were actually um, uh, maintained in a separate location. Okay. Um, so, uh, so the lost records were um, for that one particular site. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And like, how far off were the dates in terms of the records between the, the FIT and the SARC and all that? So in terms of the, <clears throat> the manner in which we test the dates for the SARC, so it's, um, it's actually not uncommon for this finding to be a repeat finding. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason is, is there's a delay in the actual report uh, of what it's, what's being reported on. So it's a prior year. So we might have noted, you know, Jenny's predecessor, and of no fault of her own this year, the same thing happens again in the next year sure. because they're just trying to catch up. You still have the processes. And so... Um, uh, basically, it's a, it's a very simple thing that we do when we validate the information. We just look and see the report and say, okay, uh, this is the date on the fit. This is what you guys are presenting to the public. Do they match? Um, and if they don't, we're like, okay, well, does the qualitative information match? And maybe there's 
something that we should discuss with the district in terms of why the dates match. But in this case, the, the, you know, the, the reports were not the same reports that had been uh, uh, reported to the public. Okay, so they're not, they're not wildly off, just they were just different. Uh, no, no, I mean, it's, I'm not exactly certain which, I can't quite remember okay. what, uh, how, what the disparity of it was, but it could be one day off, honestly. Um, in, but if the information was the same, I might qualify it with the, with the staff say, hey, it's off by a day. Was that just an accident? Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. The rest of my questions already got addressed. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee Boleno Scow. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I heard. Did you say something about Mr. Escobar about footnote 12 and 14? Sen some sensitive. Yeah. And what wh is that referring to what we're already talking about, or is that something else? Oh, no, that's something uh, else. Um, it's the pension plans, okay. the CalSTRS, CalPERS, and then your other post employment. Is benefits. that in here as well? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. thank you. Anything else, Trustee Blasco? Good for now. That's it. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Seeing none. Um, I I would just like to echo um, what Jenny's already noted, and also Mr. Escobar has noted, is that we've had significant change in the highest level of leadership and management of the school district in this past year and significant turnover um, in all these high-level positions. And I'd just like everyone to note that and recognize that. And that's also not an uncommon thing to happen, <clears throat> whether it's in the public sector, the private sector, the corporate sector. It's very common when a top-level administrator leaves that there's a significant influx of other high-level management change and to recognize that. And I think both Ms. Inman um, Dr. Contreras have identified, I don't think we'll be hearing a bit of a different report next, a year from now. Um, so I just would encourage everybody to be hopeful with that and to recognize that. So seeing no other deliberation from the board, I will call for a motion um, to approve this action item. I'll move to approve. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Can I have a second? A second. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any um, opposed? Any abstaining? Seeing none, that will carry 601. Thank you, Mr. Escobar, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. M. Um, 11.2, the 24-25 Local Control Accountability Plan. This report will be presented by our superintendent of PBUSD schools, Dr. Contreras. Good evening. Uh, we had a previous presentation at a board meeting on our local control accountability plan. I want to compliment that report because we involved community in actually reporting out what they had done and, and how they had done that planning. And there was lots of community input, parents who spoke at our board meeting and helped in the presentation as well as students. So really well done on that. And uh, tonight what we are doing is asking for approval of the local control accountability plan based on the presentation that you heard in a previous board meeting. The LCAP, just as a review, is our plan for how we spend our funding and the services in our key priority areas that we will um, engage in to support the learning of our students. Uh, included in every LCAP plan is the LCFF budget overview for parents. We include our plan summary. We engage our educational partners through goals and actions that they'd like to see within the community. We look at how are we going to increase and improve our services for our foster youth, our homeless, our English learners, as well as our low-income students. Um, and then we always look at our, if we're meeting our goals. Um, that plan has been on display and open for public review um, since the previous board presentation. And so now, like I said, we ask that for your approval on that plan. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Do we have any public speakers on this item? We do not. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board at this time? 
I'll move to approve. I have a motion to approve from doc, Trustee Dr. Holm. Can I'll I have set. a second? I'll second. I have a second from Trustee DeSerpa. Any other deliberation before I call for the vote? Uh, Trustee uh, Bolano Scow. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for their work. And I just looking through it, and if, if the public takes time, and any of, any of our PVUSD community, we have some ambitious goals in there when you're looking at the three-year outcomes, and they're great. It's good to be ambitious. Um, and um, I think it's just looking forward to plans and how we can make it happen. So let's all just say that. But I think it's great to be ambitious. Sometimes we hear the history of this district, and it's, uh, what can you do? And so we can actually be ambitious and improve things. So looking forward to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Polano scow Anyone else? Seeing none, I have a first and a second, so I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Thank you. Uh, 11.3, approval of the 24-25 proposed budget and statement of reasons and of excess reserves above minimum reserves. This report will be presented by our director, director excuse me, of fiscal services and interim CBO, Ms. M. Thank you, welcome back. Good evening again, Board of Trustees, President Acosta, Superintendent Dr. Contreras. My name is Jenny M and I am here to uh, bring back our 24-25 proposed budget and statement of excess reserves. This is the same presentation um, from last Thursday during the public hearing. Uh, no changes um, to the materials except for the addition of tonight's board date. And I respectfully request the approval and adoption. Thank you, Ms. M. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. All right, seeing none, I will bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board at this time? I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. I have a first. Uh, Trustee Bolano Scow, would you like to comment? A second and a comment, please. I'm happy to thank second. You. And I just want to thank uh, Ms. Jenny M for her work on this beautiful binder. I've been reading it for the past couple of days. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to make an offer to the public. If anybody wants to come have coffee with me and look at this binder and want to learn more about our budget, it's a great, great tool, uh, and it's very understandable. And there's a lot of questions we've all asked over the years. And once I go, boom, there it is. So uh, thank you for all your work in providing this. And uh, this is, takes a lot of work, and it's very important. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scow, for your comment and for your second. So any other deliberation from the board? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Thank you, Ms. Emmons. Yes, thank you for all your work on that as well. Thank you. Sorry, I should have echoed that before I voted. <laughs> um, all right, now we are going to, we put 11.5 before 11.1 on the approval of the agenda. Uh, this is expanded learning program plan and spending plan for 24-25, and this report will be presented by our director of expanded learning, Ms. Bruno, Littleton Bruno. Thank you, welcome. Sorry, let's try that again. Good evening, President Acosta, Superintendent Dr. Contreras, and Board of Trustees. I'm Jen Littleton Bruno, the Director of Expanded Learning. And I'm so excited to be here with you tonight and share this presentation. So, um, do we have the clicker? Are you able to? Okay, we're ready. So we have our mission statement and we can um, move on from there. Um, we are, in this presentation, we are looking at goal one, two, and three. And for expanded learning, the state of California has expanded learning opportunity guiding practices. These are the practices that you will see right here. Our programs in PVOSD are based around these practices. These are guiding practices. And so when we are creating programs and systems for our students, we reflect back at these guiding practices. And if you were to go to any after school program across our state, you would hope that you would see these same guiding practices in their programming. In the state of California, with our new funding that we have, which is our Expanded Learning Opportunities Program Funds, again, that is the funding that is much like Title I. It's an, it's, and entitlement to our community and to our students. This is our program funding that is not our grants. A requirement of this, 
one of the only requirements of this at this time is our program plan, which you have attached here. In the program plan, there are 11 different focus areas. As a district, we have met with community partners, parents, had surveys over the last two years, and we develop our program plan based upon our specific community, the students, and the services that we expect our students should have in our programs. So this is attached to your um, packet, and we're hoping that by the end of this presentation, you'll feel that you're able to approve it. And then this is posted on our website per the guidance and requirements of CDE. This is a presentation of our program plan. And now we're looking at what our programs look like in PVOSD for our expanded learning. So in the orange, you will see our elementary programming, our inner sessions. And so this year, I was doing the math, and we offered 94 intercession days. You may be wondering, what is an intercession? This is a new word. An intercession is a non-school day. And what we were able to do is offer 94 nine-hour days this school year by the end of um, going back to school in August. This is huge. And so that's what that orange little chart shows. Um, it was 80. Um, I just redid the math, and we are at over 90. Um, and over the school year, Expanded Learning is now working with 9,000 students. 9,000 different PVUSD students are engaged in one type of our programming. This has grown a huge number um, than just last year or the year before. So in um, not too long ago, right after COVID, we were working with about 3,000 students over a full school year. We are now at 9,000 students. So this is very exciting. Some of our Saturday intercessions might look like Saturdays in the park, the YMCA, Camp Wow activities and field trips, our summer school program, winter intercession, spring intercession, Thanksgiving intercession, and our newly released July camps. So those are all different activities of our intercessions. We also now run all of our after school programs, before school breakfast club programs. In this next school year, we're looking at launching even more garden programs and after school program and intervention programs so that we can really have targeted student supports during the after school hours because we do have our students so much longer that we really want to be able to utilize the time and make that time the best for them because that's what they deserve. In the high school level, we have clubs, enrichment, credit recovery, high school employment opportunities. This summer, we are employing over 40 high schoolers throughout PVOSD. Those students are becoming youth leaders. They're working for PVOSD, many of them one of their first jobs, and they're working with our own students. So it's a really great piece of our program. We continue that into the school year as well. Our program contracts and site service agreements. Um, this is just a list of some of the programs that we use site service agreements for and some of the different vendors that we do. Currently, um, I'm working with purchasing with Rich, and we are working with a request for proposal with our service providers. I just want to share that this is not a competitive process. This is a qualifying process to ensure that we're able to get providers that can qualify and agree to the regulations that our district has. You will see our full budget here. I just want to go over a couple things. So the ELOP budget is at $17 million this year. It is expected to go up. ELOP, again, is not a grant, so we as a district are not applying for this. This is not something that we you know, are likely to lose. This is an entitlement to the district and to our students and community. Then we have 21st century grants that we apply for, ACES, assets, and this summer we're using the last of our ESSER 3 summer funding. We operate 
with no usage of any general funds. We actually assist with other departments to ensure that we are supporting all students in all departments all the time. And so this is a really neat piece of our program. Our um, last year's budget was 43 million due to some carryover. Uh, we're looking at 38 million next year with our carryover. And then it, going on forward, we're looking at that we should be about 32 million to 35 million is our estimate if you're looking at what carryover we will continue having. Our ongoing budget should be 25 million. This next year, we will be a little bit higher due to having some contracts that will push forward into other years. Next steps for this presentation is that if you um, approve this, which is what I'm kindly asking, is that Expand and Learning will work with purchasing and site service providers to be able to run our RFP and to be able to do site services. We also will post our ELOP program plan on PVUSD's website per our program compliance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bruno. Do we have any public comments on this item? On 11.5, yes, we do. Chris Webb. Uh, I, I want to say I think Jen Bruno does a great job with ELOP, and you should approve this. Um, I, in support of the goals, I think one way with respect to Renaissance that you could boost academic achievement with integrity the ELOP would be to restore the after-school program of model continuation Renaissance. This would mean budgeting and planning for one bus to pick up students from Renaissance participating in that program. The after school program under the real Renaissance consistently had more students participating in it than staff. The same cannot be said for what we saw this past year. Pre-COVID, the student progress monitoring system and variable credit system were integrated into the after school program and that's part of what made pre-COVID Renaissance more successful, more safe, more honest. Without those things, without a safe field, without restoring the role of academic advisors, I feel it's disingenuous to the community, disrespectful to alumni, and to veteran Renaissance staff to even use the name Renaissance. If the school is truly broken beyond restorative repair, then change the name of the school and communicate the new vision and mission for that school. Dr. Contreras and Holmes, we, I, I think we should meet and discuss the institutions of real Renaissance, um, just to, partly to correct misconceptions that have been communicated. Um, and then also, so you could take the lessons of that program and apply them across the district, because compared to that progress monitoring system, to me, the district MTSS seems not as good, to put it lightly. Um, also, one other thing I would say would be using the ELOP funds to restore the auto shop would be another good way to genuinely improve the school, plus um, expand facilities that can serve M&O. And that's another thing, like you, I can guarantee you, kids will be more likely to attend school if they had that, a program like that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Is that all of our public comment on this item? Yes. All right. I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Yes, Trustee Dr. Holm. Um, on uh, <clears throat> slide, I think, eight, uh, the budget uh, slide, it basically it said that the 24, 25 expenses are about uh, 28 million, and that there's a call out box that says the ongoing expenses are in just over 25 million. And does that mean there are, were, are expected to be one-time expenses? Or, or exactly. That, okay. So with our request for proposal, um, request for proposals that I'm working with purchasing on, we have a great opportunity that we actually will have some proposals that come into us from multi-year proposals. With our funding, it will allow us to prepay part of those. And so our expenses will then go down because they will be prepaid into those next years. So thank you for asking that. Thanks. Thank you. That's it for me. That's it, Trustee Dr. Holm. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Trustee Deserpa, please. Um, we are so fortunate, and I don't know. Do other schools in the in California get the type of funding that we get? 
So great question. This was going to go into my next presentation, but I'll share a little bit now. So we are part of Region 5, which is all the way Santa Clara, San Jose, down to Soledad, Santa Cruz County. Um, Santa Clara is 50% of the funding of our region. PVUSD is about 20% of the 100% of Region 5 funding. So including all of Santa Clara, San Jose, Santa Cruz, down to Soledad, we are 20% of that funding. We are one of the largest funders, especially in our region. Another really exciting thing about our region and the way we run our programs, most other districts actually outsource all their programming, we actually run all that programming. And so that funding is going to 500 PVOSD staff members. And so we're able to run our programs, which is really unique and a very different model than many other districts. Does it help to ensure quality in the programming? It really does because we become a continuous. We do not, we're not seen as the after school program, right? Our staff are often our credential teachers and our classified staff members, and they're part of the full day. Our goal, my goal the last two years as director has been to really unite us both at the school day and within the district, that we are not a separate program. We are part of a continuous day for students because it's the same students and it's the same staff. And when we have the staff who knows what students need, then they're able to do the activities. Or like for summer school, some of our teachers are having a little bit more time to do music and art. They're creating those relationships. And so when they see those same students next year, hey, how are you? It just changes that vibe and that, that connection that they have with their teacher. And so I think that it's a huge asset to our community that our teachers and our staff are working with our students. Have we seen any positive um, positivity in terms of, because um, this program hasn't been in place. Well, how long has it been in place? Okay, so the full expanded learning, which was extended learning, is just about 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, but as of just three years ago, our budget was 12 million to 13 million. And so just for two years now, we've been in the 40 million range. Um, and we've seen great, great feedback from families, students, and teachers who are able to say that they're seeing changes and that they actually, I um, just at the end of the school year, I had a parent who emailed me and said, I tried to pull my student out of school early. And they said, but they told me, no, you can't pull me out of school. I have to stay for school because I want to go to after school program. So no, I am not missing school because I need to be part of that program. That's great. I've been to a couple of your events. Um, one of them uh, was a night that you essentially rented out the Monterey Bay Aquarium on a Friday night, I think on it was. On a Saturday, yeah. Saturday, and um, in including all the catering, and it was such a special night, like with little candlelit tables and, you know, set against the beautiful aquarium. And I just want to say that we had so many Spanish-speaking families there and it just, it brought tears to my eyes, actually, seeing how beautiful it was a family event for moms, dads, babies, children. It was so special so that you can do events like this. I know you've done Gilroy Gardens and a lot of other really cool things. Yeah. And we have Gilroy Gardens this weekend, if anyone's interested. We have two different days for families. This summer, also, we're taking 500 participants to Washington, D.C. as well within these programs. And those pieces, those events, which we call Parho Passport, I had and our team had the privilege of um, meeting with Michael Funk, who is from the Department of Education's Director of Expand and Learning for the full state. And we were able to share our practices. And he was just blown away with what we're doing in our community and just was able to share with us that this is the vision that the state has and that he was just so excited because he had not heard of other school districts pushing this so far for their families to offer these opportunities. It's just great. It's life-changing. That's what we so hope. many children, yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Bolano Scout. Yeah, thank you, Jen, for this awesome work, awesome presentation. Um, 
it's really exciting to see so much happening uh, for our community. Uh, and so thanks again. I will abstain because I do music teaching for El Sistema, which is a contractor. I just want to explain that, why I will be abstaining. But I just want to acknowledge the good work being done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee bolano -Scow. Anyone else? Trustee Flores. Yes, I want to thank you for all the work that uh, Extended Learning has been doing. That bubble chart that you had that showed, you know, broke it down, really everything that has been offered is amazing. 9,000 students. And yeah, I remember just before COVID, you know, you had to try to get your application in quickly because it filled up and it wasn't the same before COVID. It was more just after school care. Um, and so now to see, you know, they're getting garden, they're getting, you know, wetlands and they're getting dance and music, they're getting so much offered to them. And then I also want to say congratulations on, you know, what you had mentioned, taking 500 students to DC who participated in our summer school. That's amazing. That's, uh, I'm excited and proud to be able to say what PVUSD is doing with their extended learning. So with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Thank you, Trustee Serbi. I mean, Trustee Flores. <laughs> We're just all over the board tonight. It's definitely the end of a fiscal year. Um, yes, and team building. So thank you, Trustee Flores, for your comments in the first. I'm looking right at her and I called her that. Um, <laughs> anyone else? I'd like to second the motion. Okay, now Trustee DeSerpa, the real Trustee <laughs> DeSerpa will second that. So I have a first and second, and I'm gonna make a quick comment. Um, I, I just really wanna commend you, Jen, and your whole team for what you're doing and what you've done with and taken this in three years, essentially. And I'll just echo um, from personal experience what Trustee Flores just commented about the, taking the 500 students to DC. I had the, um, I was one of 40 students nationwide during my undergrad program that landed an internship in DC for a summer. And it was a truly fabulous, experience and really life-changing and, and exposing me to so much. So, I mean, those students are going to have a fabulous time. So, thank you for all you're doing, you and your team. Thank you. And so, I have a first and a second. So, I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any no? Any abstaining? Aye. That's going to carry 5011. Thank you. And you're sticking with us because now we're going to bring it to 11.4. The realignment of expanded learning organizational structure um, resulting in general fund revenue um, for, again, this report will be presented again by the Director of Expanded Learning, Ms. Littleton Bruno. Good evening again. Um, we can keep going um, one more time. All right, so this realignment will focus on different goals, goal one, goal two, and goal four. Um, what you see here is a different chart, and this kind of, the chart that you just got to see, this is the staffing behind those programs. And so you have your director, me, Ms. Jen Littleton-Bruno, and we have a assistant director. We have five program directors and one high school program director. You'll notice that the blue and the green chart have a purple kind of hue around it. And what I want to touch on is those are direct, those are administrators that directly support students. They are on school sites. Those are not district level administrators. Those are stu staff members who are directly at schools with students during the day. Um, and then you'll see at the bottom of that is another, you know, blue hue with the purple and the green. And those are the sites that those specific people are working with. And so what you'll see is that our five program directors are actually overseeing 25 school sites between them. This means that they have a good deal of staff and students that they are responsible for. Our high school program director oversees every comprehensive school and all of our other um, non-comprehensive independent charter, or our charter schools. And so what that means is that our staffing has been stretched really thin. And so this is the chart that shows what services each person is charge of. 
Our hope tonight with your approval is that we look at restructuring expanded learning to really look at how we are supporting students and how we can better support students. So we are looking at systems and structures to change to be able to better support our students and our programs for our students. What this restructure is, is that it adds two more assistant directors, an assistant director of elementary and assistant director of secondary. Our assistant director of elementary, our hope is that we're able to add new programs that this assistant director would be able to oversee. Our new programs is one piece that is really, for me, an important piece that we add and enhance in our programs is the interventions that we are able to offer our students. Right now, I believe that we need to be able to have someone who can look at our students and do the MTSS process and see the multiple tiers of systems of support to be able to show what do students need. If you see a student who is struggling, where are they struggling? And right now our staffing does not have that ability. We are stretched a little bit thin. And so what we hope to do, and if you look on EdJoin as of Friday, we opened 10 PVFT teacher positions. There are TOSA positions to be able to offer um, system supports to do interventions. So these teachers, this is really cutting edge. These, this is the first time in PVUSD and possibly some of the first in our state of hiring full-time teachers whose main focus would be after school program. And so that our students have somebody whose full focus is working between a couple schools to ensure that they get interventions that they need and that they deserve. And so our assistant director of elementary that we are proposing would oversee that program. Our current assistant director would then become an ELOP director, and they would be able to assist both garden education, adding that into our program more comprehensive and into more school sites, as well as branching out to offer enrichment um, clubs during the school year. So looking at what's been so successful of our summer enrichment programs, branching out and adding that. So if a student has always wanted to take Taekwondo or do swimming, we give them that opportunity. We pay for their family to be able to offer them this experience. This is something that right now we just don't have the staffing to be able to do, and we want to get those services to students. Our assistant director of secondary, we are now assisting with the middle school sports program so that we can ensure that middle school sports, we now financially support it. And what we've noticed while I've been working with uh, Jenny and with our middle school principals is that it needs extra support. We need someone to be able to work with ADs and our principals to ensure students are getting the services they need. So um, lastly, this also changes my position to an executive director position. Um, we believe, or I believe also, is that I am now overseeing 31 school sites. I oversee every day of school from 6.50 a.m. until almost 6, 6 p.m. to 6.30. 7 o'clock is when our last buses get home. We run programs before school in the middle of the day all the way until 6 p.m. And as I shared, we run over 90 additional days that are nine hours a day. This job in the last two years since ELOP has come has definitely changed our whole department. Again, we went from 12 to 13 million to about 40 million. We went from 21 school sites to 31 school sites. We went from anywhere from 1,600 to 2,000 students to now over 9,000 students per year. Um, when we were running numbers the other day, uh, Jenny and I were talking that we actually locally have school districts smaller than the program that we are running in expanded learning. Again, this is the chart. Um, it's able to show you the purple is actually direct services that we would like to add based upon having these new staff members so that we're able to really support students and grow the programs in the way that we believe our students and our community deserve. Our program directors, who we are asking for one more program director, the reason why we really want that one more person is these staff have administrative credentials. And so they are the staff that are able to work with students and staff management, ed code, 
discipline, and personnel matters. That our classified staff that are at our school sites, they are not management. And that we cannot ask them to do these things. It's not fair to them and it's not right. And so we need one more staff member at that ground level to ensure that our classified staff and our students have the support they need and they deserve at that level. Um, you will see our budget again, which you already kind of saw, but this one has um, the restructuring. In our restructuring cost, it shows the additional cost of that we are now offering 20 full-time PVFT staff member positions. And so um, it shows you our new positions. There's three management. We are working with our um, HR classified and with Jenny to ensure that we are also adding IAs so that we can have six hour IAs to work with students. It's super exciting. They're actually gonna start when the school day is going on so that they can go in and watch model teachers and learn best practices and then they're gonna bring those into after school. So what our hope is, is this is kind of a little start of a mini teacher pipeline that they're getting those experiences and then we're bringing it back into the after school program. So new positions is management three, classified staff 14, PVFT employees 20. And in um, this, this does not touch any general fund. As of next year, the state just announced a ADA program that will start July 2025. And so we, an after school program for the first time, will be able to assist with basic attendance recovery. And so our credential teachers that we are hiring, we, the state has said, as of July 2025, if you have credential teachers working with students after school, we can start recovering their ADA. So students who have missed 15 days, they can recover up to 15 days. If I give you rough estimates, we believe this will assist in bringing $1 million to $2 million into general revenue into the school district. This is super exciting for us. Um, we're really excited that we can not only just help families, help students, but for the first time actually bring in general um, ADA to the school district. My next steps is to work with human resources, the financial department to ensure proper paperwork and implementation for a restructure and work with student services and finance to implement attendance and recovery at after school attendance program if you as a board decide to um, approve this. Thank you, Ms. Brenner. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we do not. All right, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Trustee Flores. The ADA um, assistance program sounds amazing. Can you give me an example of how that would work? Like, let's say we have a third grader who's not part of the after school program. So, how would it look for them to be able to make up some time? Yeah, so the first I see it as a multiple tiered program, right? So our general will be those after school students. In addition, summer school time. In addition, intercession times. And then we can work with school site to offer certain days where we have interventions for those students. So that intervention teacher can say, oh, I noticed that this student needs to get pulled. So we're gonna pull him every Tuesday or her Mondays and Tuesdays for this time. And then we're able to recruit that attendance. Sounds great. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Anyone else? Trustee Dr. Holm. Just, you know, recognizing the, the numbers of, you know, students and personnel that this programming covers. And, you know, I hope that, you know, in, in you know, various board comments and such, you know, we had acknowledged you and your team. And I hope that you will pass on to your team, you know, that acknowledgement because it is, and I hope that, it's, it's just, it really is a team effort. It, it really is. Thank you so much. You know, we have a huge summer program. And what this has meant is our expanded learning opportunity specialists, our um, classified staff who are running our school sites, they've been on school sites about 10 hours a day to 11 hours a day the last 13 days. Mm -hmm. And they're paid overtime. They, we are starting programs. Every school, our 16 sites, they're starting at 7.30 in the morning 
and we're ending at 4.30, but they don't leave because they wait to get the all clear from transportation. So they're leaving at 5, 5.30. These staff are holding our community and our students so high, and I, I talked to our staff, I was just talking to one today, and I said, this is not my program. I am not the shining light. This is our program. You are each holding our community and our students, and I'm just so lucky to be able to have such a wonderful team, so thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Anyone else? Trustee DeSerpa. Um, could any of this money in the budget be used for facility upgrades or facilities? So great question. Um, so what we are working on, our first, um, our first test of this is the Pajaro field. And so we have been carving away um, and asking the state questions that they let me know no one else is asking. Um, and so we are working on, it's a split usage chart. And so basically, we in Expand and Learning need to see what percent of the facilities would be used by after school time versus regular school time. And the reason that's important is uh, we had an audit that was shared today, right? So we have to share in with the state and with our auditors what percent we can pay for. So if we are in a room for 80% of the day, or 80% of the school year and such, those hours, we can pay for 80% of that. And so we are currently working with a number of schools who are asking me those same questions. And so there's a chart that um, I worked with our past CBO on to ensure that we do that. And then we do an MOU within our own school district. And so we were able to share this with the state um, and they said that this is we are actually, they said an example that they're sharing with others of how you can do this because that is a very tricky thing to do because we do not want to be supplanting because if we are seen as supplanting for the school day, then we could lose those funds and other funds. And so yes, we can with a lot of work and a lot of um, documentation. That's great, really good news. I just think about a lot of the school sites, like at Valencia where my kids went, like we put together the garden just with volunteers and donated and you know, donations and a lot of elbow grease. But there's a lot of schools that where parents are working two and three jobs just to pay their rent. And so they don't have access to volunteers like we did. Yeah. Um, so I can just see where it would be really helpful to, you know, be investing in the garden program, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. And the gardens are going to be a core part of our after school program. So we will be the one funding all of, you know, the soil, the starts, the supplies needed. And so that's a great way that we're able to show that we're using it in after school and summer school. And therefore, we are, we are the ones paying for it. That's great. Well, there's a lot of economic development, I think, in the community as a result of this money um, yeah. flowing out to employees and, and to all of the different nonprofits that are partners, et cetera. So this is really a wonderful thing for the community. Thank you, Jen. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Anyone else? I just a quick sure. Thank you. Yeah, Trustee Vice President. Thanks, Jen, for all the great work. I mean, your program is a district within the district, essentially. I just had a question in regard to those six-hour positions. Are those going to be benefited? Yeah, they be? are. Yeah, okay. so we have a couple of them. We rolled them out last year with our TK programs. And so those are benefited positions. And then what we are doing is we're rolling them out this year and next year. We are doing a slow rollout is because if there are any positions that would normally be cut, um, we are actually going to be offering those staff we would like to change your hours if you would like to do that and come to work to after school programs so that there will be, we won't have to cut any um, IAs. All right, good. That, just from a recruitment standpoint. Yeah. Sure. All right, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trustee Vice President Soto. Anyone else? Okay, so um, I just had a couple of brief questions. Mm -hmm. um, in looking at your the realignment, um, the dreaded question around what we're all going to be tasked with in the 24-25 school year and board beyond, um, declining enrollment. 
Um, so were there considerations given to that and what sort of impact are you looking at that on your department, if you could? Yeah, so the lowest that our department sees us going is about $29 million, even with declining enrollment. And so you've considered this in the whole this is realignment? Within, this is within this, and then even after that, so we we have a unique curse is that we have too, we, we have too much carryover right now. Okay. And so um, it's, it's a very unique piece to be in in education. And so this is even beyond that. Our budget would be $25 million. We're looking at the minimum that our budget would be at. Like our spending budget's $25 million per year. We're looking at the lowest with declining enrollment that we would go down to is $29 million. That would still give us $4 million carryover per school year. And you would, if that were to happen, you foresee that in the 24, 25 or 25, 26? I don't see that until 26, 27. Okay. Um, things are looking really good for us. We have, you know, the Parho Passport that you guys were talking about. We have started our own marketing for attendance and enrollment. And so you have to come to after school program and have 80 to 90% attendance. So we've done some things because I had those same concerns. And so we have kind of our own marketing and attendance that we look at within our programs um, to be able to address those concerns. Okay. And I don't want to be the doom and gloom. No, it's just I the understand. conversation that yeah, no. we all need to be having. So I just wanted I to see what foresight there yeah. was with that. So, and, and I didn't say on the last presentation, which I meant to, I've also had the liberty and the pleasure to attend some of your after school programs um, multiple times and seeing what's going on firsthand with our youth and this, the teachers and this, the classified employees. And it's just amazing the energy when you step on um, to the campuses and what's going on and just the community that's built at these sites around that. So again, I know I said it earlier, but I'm going to keep saying it. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, you know, you said you didn't want to make it all about you, but, you know, it, it's something's always got to start at the top and work its way down the same as we have with the superintendent. And I agree with what Trustee Soto said. You're really running a school district within a school district. So I commend you for that. And thank you. I think you're very deserving of this opportunity and your team. And thank you for answering the tough questions mm -hmm. as well tonight. So any other deliberation? I'm gonna call for the vote. All those in favor? Did we have a motion? Aye. No. Any, um, did no? Did we, did we have a motion? I'm, oh, I'm so <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'll make I'll a move. motion to approve. I'll second. <laughs> I have a first by Trustee DeSerp. I have a second by Dr. Hall. Excuse me. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any um, no? Any abstaining? It's going to carry 601. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> okay. Now moving to 11.6, the Chief Business Officer contract. This report will be presented by our Superintendent of PBS Schools, Dr. Heather Contreras. Thank you very much. As you know, we have had an interim uh, CBO for the past nearly one year, and that interim CBO is Jenny M. Uh, Jenny has done a fantastic job in her position, and one of the things I believe that she encompasses is integrity, transparency, and honesty. And I am very, very thrilled to bring this contract uh, before you for recommendation um, of making Jenny M. the official chief business officer for the Pajaro Valley District. Because this is a cabinet level position, I do need to read out some important parts of her, um, of her contract. And that is attached for you to look at as well. Uh, Jenny's, uh, or the CBO's, um, contract will be at the rate of $188,147, a range 51. This position is 222 days a year. There is a car allowance compensation of $600 a month, um, and she will be entitled to vacation days similar to uh, what the 222 days would, would offer. So I ask that we, um, or I recommend 
that Jenny M. be approved for the position of the chief business official. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Uh, Trustee Dr. Hall. So, your integrity has shown throughout, you know, all the presentations you give, you have a clarity of speech and you present information that is oftentimes arcane <laughs> to most people and you have an ability to communicate that clearly. One of the things that we have heard from our constituents is a, an incredible need for transparency. Um, and, and sometimes one of the difficulties, with, with, especially with budget information, is just the sheer volume of information. And one of the things that I have appreciated about your presentations is you managed to distill down massive amounts of information into clear, comprehensive information while still conveying the breadth of information is there, that is there. And that is so important to not just the functioning of the district, but also the integration of what the district does with the community. Um, you know, in uh, Brandon's comments, you know, he mentioned looking forward, you know, to, you know, PVFT working, looking forward to working with you. Our employee organizations are a key component of our district having good working relationships with our employee organizations is incredibly important. So hearing that kind of statement means a lot to me. Um, you know, and I, 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 I over and over again hear good things and I'm looking forward to voting yes. <laughs> Thank you, Trust <clears throat> Trustee Dr. Holm, Trustee Bolanoskow. <clears throat> Yes, I want to second everything Dr. Holmes said, and uh, I think this is a, a, a great day for our district. Uh, it's uh, Jenny's proven herself in all the ways Dr. Holmes has said, and as I pointed out earlier with this beautiful budget binder, which I'm going to keep on my coffee table for a while. Um, and I also want to congratulate our superintendent, Heather Contreras, for, action, for making this happen as well, and uh, this will be the filling out filling out the cabinet here so um, uh, we're happy to make a motion to approve the contract thank you trustee Bolano scout <clears throat> I'd Any like other? to second that motion okay thank you trustee and um, welcome Jenny I'm really glad that you um, are, have considered becoming the chief business officer you have um, the skill and the historical knowledge working with Clint over the last few years, and you have the temperament and the patience. So thank you very, very much for stepping into this position. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Florence? I also want to just echo everything that has already been said and just thank you for choosing PVUSD to, um, you know, where you can work with us because I know you could probably excel in, in any district, but we are very fortunate to have you here at PVUSD and just the transparency that we see in your presentations has just really helped us all to um, really dive deeper into these budgets and really with a better understanding. And so thank you again for choosing PVUSD. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Trustee Vice President Soto. Well, Jenny, welcome. Congratulations, thanks. I know uh, we had some discussions, you had some apprehension, but uh, I think you made the right choice and I'm proud that you're here. And I've seen several CBOs come through and I've never seen anybody explain the material that you have in the way that you do it because it's very dry material, but the way that you present it makes it interesting. I mean, it caught my attention and you know, I'm about as dumb as a bag of hammers. But uh, yeah, that's, that's great. And um, I think that you're a great addition to Heather's team. That's, uh, 
the foresight that we that I have or I see for Heather and her cabinet is to to build that team that you know that's going to steer this ship in the right direction. And I think you're you're one of the great additions to that. So welcome and thank you. Thank you, Trustee Vice President. So the, I haven't called for the vote, but they're all welcoming you. You know. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to echo pretty much everything that's been said, and um, I know I've had the opportunity to talk with you one-on-one -on -one as well, and I just think you have, I don't think, I know and believe you to have a very high moral compass, and that is something that this district needs at this level. I cannot see a more perfect fit for this district, for the CBO, for our superintendent to fulfill fill her cabinet, which she needs as well. Um, and so I'm looking forward, not that I'm counting the vote before it's happened like everyone else, um, but I'm looking very forward to the future and I don't mean to be the doom and gloom, but there is a reality on the horizon for the 24-25 school year and beyond. And, and I know you're going to be the right one to help steer this district alongside our superintendent in um, navigating us and the board, future boards, through some very challenging times. And so I, I believe you to be the truly right fit and that high moral compass that you have inside of you is going to be a big part of that. That's part of what's bringing the transparency that several of us have been striving for to have and to see and for community members to be also telling us that they see that with you too. That means so much. So you're going really far. Thank you. And I said it. Um, a week ago, not even a week ago, six days ago. It's been awesome for me to be in this position and watch you just really flourish in this position. So I'm happy to be welcoming you to being our permanent CBO, which you very well deserve, but I haven't called for the vote and I'm not counting votes, but I'm gonna call for the vote now because I got a first and a second, I believe this time, right? Yes, I have a first by Trustee Scow, a second by Trustee DeSerpa. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? That carries 601. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you, everyone. Um, now we will move on to 11.7 approve assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction, the professional development. And this report will be presented by the superintendent of PBUSD schools, Dr. Heather Contreras. Good evening. One of the things that you know we are working towards as a district is to be high functioning as board members, as cabinet members, uh, as a district as a whole. And that really starts, number one, with the board. So I thank the board for the decision that they just made with Jenny. And that was uh, really amazing teamwork that happened uh, to bring Jenny into PBUSD. So I'm excited about that. But we're also looking at structures, at structures and systems within the cabinet level and beyond uh, that help to support the core functions of a K-12 system. The core functions of a K-12 system really are student support services, our curriculum and instruction or teaching and learning, the educational services, things like um, our LCAP, our title dollars, our ELOP, um, as well as our human capital, our human resources department, and of course being fiscally solvent. What I'm seeking to do is to create a system of alignment to our core functions so that our positions align with what we do as a district. Uh, we had an opportunity to maybe restructure and look at how we can align those positions to our core functions, provide optimal support to the school sites, which is where the magic happens, um, and create a cohesive system. So with that, I am asking to convert the current assistant superintendent of elementary education into an assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction and professional development. This person would be overseeing all of the curriculum and instruction for the district, such as board adoptions, uh, as well as professional development uh, from the classroom um, all the way on up. So I'm asking your approval of this job description. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Any public speakers on this comment? I mean, on this item? None. All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? 
Trustee Flores. Well, I just want to take this time to also acknowledge uh, Claudia for your time on our cabinet also. And now we have this team of three and we have more to go still, but thank you for what you have gone through this last year of all the changing and everything. But um, I think this is a, a good change and I'm looking forward to seeing what these new changes can do for helping to guide our district in the, in the right direction. So, but thank you. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Anyone else? Trustee DeSerpa. So I'm sorry, which position is this again that we're con considering we know? This is the Curriculum and Instruction and Professional Development Assistant Superintendent position. And what exactly would be their role? Their role is to support all of the curriculum and instructional decisions that happen in a district, such as board adoptions, implementation of those board adoptions, implementation of curriculum into the classroom level, um, as well as the professional development that ensures that our um, students are receiving the best high quality instruction in the classroom. Okay, so years ago we added a cabinet member because I wanted the person on the cabinet, I wanted that position to be on the cabinet, to, to be sitting at the table at all times. And that was an extra position that was added. So we had an assistant soup of secondary assistant soup of elementary, and then the curriculum soup as well. That was um, Susan Perez, I think that was her position. So it just seems like, so we've lost, this, we've lost that position. So now we're sort of collapsing these positions into two separate positions. And it just makes me concerned that we would have one position that would be responsible for all curriculum from TK all the way through 12. I don't like, there's master scheduling issues that are so specific contextually to secondary. There's issues at middle school with kids having learning loss and not achieving at, at the levels we want them to. And then we've got all the early literacy stuff that's so, so important that we've made huge gains on. So I'm worried that collapsing these positions into one position, that seems like a, a great deal of content for one position to hold. So can you talk to that a little bit? Yes, we're actually not collapsing any position. This is just converting a position into a different organizational structure. Um, some of what you mentioned, like master schedule, would actually fall under or that person supporting master schedule creation would actually fall under one of the other job descriptions that I'll be bringing forward. Um, I, I do feel that, and as we go through the next job descriptions, uh, shifting some of the things into other positions makes for a better organizational structure to allow for exactly the concerns that you're uh, bringing forward to allow for better focused attention into things like the early literacy and um, other curricular pieces. Okay, so I'm going to go back in time to, uh, as well. Even before I got on the board, there were three superintendents, one for South, Central, and North Zone. And the reason those three positions were created was because um, those areas had their own specific needs and parents and community did not feel like their needs were being met. So again, my concern is that these two positions, the way they're aligned, are not gonna be able to meet the needs of every area of our district. Can you speak to that a little bit about what your, yeah, what your vision is? This is very is? different. This is not going into a north, middle, or south zone. That is not uh, the intent. This is really to look at a comprehensive K-12 system so that we are looking at our curriculum, pre-K-12 really, pre-K-12, that there's alignment and understanding from the person in the position of the assistant superintendent who understands the scope and sequence of all of it and how it's built together and works together um, as we develop our students and prepare them for graduation and beyond. Um, so I, the work is exactly the same work that currently exists. It's just organizing the work in a different way to make it a little bit more coherent. Okay, so I want to support you as our new superintendent. I have concerns that, that, that the, it's too much work and it's too divergent in terms of T, TK through sixth grade, middle school, and then secondary. But I, I will support you uh, in this uh, realignment. Is that all, Trustee DeSerpa? I'll make a motion to approve. 
Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa, for your motion. I'll second. Trustee Bolano Scow. Did you have any other questions, comments, or deliberation? I think that Dr. Heather Contreras made some great points as to why how, how this makes sense and how a bu there's a bunch of parts within, I think, the DO that she's trying to put into alignment and within the cabinet level and in the supporting administrative positions. And I know she's got a handle on that. So I'm looking forward to see it, seeing it in action. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scow and Trustee DeSerpa. Anyone else? Okay, um, my, I'm gonna just ask you a simple question, and I think you've already answered it. Um, is this what you believe and feel that you need to do to sort of right align the district and the cabinet with your vision after what you've come into for almost the last two months with also including your look, listen, and learn tour. Yeah. Yes, I, I do think that this coincides, like I said, with the key areas of district function. Um, I think that one of the reasons bringing this forward at this time also was the challenges we've had in filling positions and that this uh, opens things up to maybe allow people to see themselves in the position a little bit better. And I think this alignment will create a structure that makes sense. Perfect. And I'm good with that. Anyone else? All right. I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Thank you. 11.8 uh, to approve the Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services job description. And this report will be presented by Superintendent of PBUSD Schools, Dr. Heather Contreras. Thank you. As another attempt to align our systems and services, I am proposing um, a position that is converting our current assistant superintendent of secondary education and changing that position into an assistant superintendent of educational services. Uh, this person would oversee such functions of the district as the LCAP, uh, the title dollars are state and federal, uh, the ELOP program, CTE, um, and other functions that are services related to education. Um, this person would also be working closely with our principals, as would the other position as well, and providing support to the sites. Uh, I think this creates an alignment within all the services that are educationally related in our district and helps to build that K-12 system, again, with one person holding that continuum of, uh, of a pre-K-12 system. So I ask for approval of this job description. This would be a position that will be advertised immediately if approved. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Any public speakers on this item? We have none. Seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Oh. Trustee Bolano scout um, Yes, thank you. I guess my first question, how do you... Um, can you talk about recruit this, how the, the changes in this position and the field in general and recruitment? Is this yes more in alignment? Or? So we a couple of things uh, to point out with this. We had an assistant superintendent of secondary education. That position was advertised and did not attract many applicants to the position. One of the things that happens, I think, in a K-12 continuous system is uh, when you title something elementary or title something secondary, people from elementary will look at the secondary position and although they may have the best leadership skills, they may not see themselves in that secondary position, thinking, oh, that's not meant for me, I'm elementary, that's secondary, and vice versa. Someone applying for secondary, we may have the best people in the elementary side of the house who think, I don't have that expertise in the secondary. This creates an alignment and opens it up so that people can see themselves in the position. And truly, um, education is complex. However, with proper leadership and the ability to embrace learning, uh, it really is the leadership of a person that moves a position forward. And so we're trying to create that um, alignment and systems where we can reach out to many people who may see themselves in, the, in that position, not just for the hiring for this round, but hopefully for hiring for these systems and positions for many years to come as people move up and out or retire or resign. And it's just a way of being able to build our bench a little differently and still align to the core functions of a K-12 system. Thank you for that answer. Um, well, and I think it's 
being the having the benefit, I, I know we know people in Salinas, and they have three different districts there. We're a unified school district, and maybe at first blush, like, wow, this is a, this is a big job, this is a, but it's a, it's also makes a lot of sense I, in my view within the context of a unified school system to have people really see this overview and have a sense of the sense of progress. So um, thank you. I'm happy to make a motion to support. Thank you, Trustee Belasco. Trustee DeSerpa, did you have a question or comment? Again, I just I have concerns that our individual sites needs are not gonna get met under this system. So what I would recommend is if, if you implement this and it really doesn't seem to be working if we could revisit it at some point because the reason we went to this system is so that um, needs were being met accurately at secondary because it's completely different at the elementary sites. And yes. it takes, a sp I think it takes specific skill sets. So somebody who's been a principal on a secondary site understands deeply what those sites need and what those leaders need. And so if you're gonna hire somebody who is coming from the elementary side into this position, they have no idea what secondary needs are. So anyway. I think we have uh, capacity within the system. I think one thing to remember too going forward is that the assistant superintendent does oversee many people who continue to do the support to the sites, the boots on the ground. And so we have a lot of expertise in this district. That is one thing I have learned in, in the almost two months that I've been here. Um, we have people who are very capable um, and are very well received by our site administrators. So I feel good about that. But one thing we are um, building into our system, and this is actually gonna go out in an email in the next 24 hours, is exactly what you alluded to. If something's not working, we need to address it and fix it. And so, but we need to also know and have honest and open conversations about if it's working or not working. Um, we will be building into our systems and structures going forward, a middle, a beginning of the year, middle of the year, and end of the year survey of our site administrators to give us feedback on the level of support they feel they're receiving through these systems and structures um, so that we could see what's our baseline, what's happening middle of the year, can we make some midline adjustments, and then what's happening at the end of the year. And if those, those results are showing that we're not hitting our targets, and if our student achievement results are also showing that, as well as our huge areas of focus, it would definitely be something to revisit. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Anyone else? So I have a first. Do I have a second? I'll second. Trustee Dr. Holm, thank you. And I, I'll just add, um, my, my comment is, um, I remember when the district, um, as an employee of the district, when it was divided into the North, Central, South, and even that in its own way had the ability that it created this division in the district. Um, and I've heard different things from different um, site level teachers um, at different sites with concerns even with the current structure of the assistant soup of primary and the assistant soup of secondary, some issues there. So I'm, I'm full well confident um, in the job that we hired you to do with, to lead this district and to run it. And I, I believe full well that if you find that something's not working, you're going to address it. And I think you're kind of already finding that this is, um, isn't maybe working. So it needs to be addressed and looked at. So I'm, I'm full well supportive of that and full well confident that also, if you find that something's not working, you're gonna bring it back to the board and address it um, after you've addressed it at the district level with your admin and team too. So, so we have a first, we have a second. Anything else from anyone else? All right, seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? 601, that carries, thank you. And then now moving to 11.9, who approved the Executive Director of Student Support Services job description. This um, will also be presented by the Superintendent of PBUSD Schools, Dr. Heather Contreras. 
Good evening. Okay, this is the last of the job descriptions uh, for this evening, and I'm asking for approval of the Executive Director of Student Support Services. Uh, currently, we have a Director of Student Support Services. This, is, this move is to elevate that position into an Executive Director um, and move all student services under that division. Uh, this would include moving the SELPA, which is a very big program that deserves a lot of support and attention into the student services division. This creates alignment because many of the supports that our special education students need cross over into our student support services division. And so there's often already a lot of collaboration that happens between that division and the SELPA. So this helps to um, create that alignment um, to have a more comprehensive system of students and uh, student supports and looking through that K-12 realm of how are we adjust, addressing the needs of social emotional um, learning for students, our MTSS program, and then students with disabilities. So I ask for approval of this position. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? I'll move to approve. I have a motion to approve. Second. Makes a lot a, of sense to me. I have a second. Uh, right? I was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, sorry. And, and a comment. Yeah. Uh, and the comment. It makes sense to you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. I just have a quick comment. Sure. So I, I just want to take a moment and uh, trust in Heather's ability to be the leader of this district and endorse her decisions because she's the one who's here every day and we're here twice a month to listen to what's going on. So I have faith in what she's doing and that's why she's here and that's why we chose her. So I think we need to have a little bit more confidence in her abilities. So you, you take the bull by the horns, Heather. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect comment. I have a first, I have a second. Any other deliberation? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 601. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Now moving to 12, our report and discussion items. We're going to start with 12.1, the Early Literacy Support Block Grant ELSB for the final annual report. And this report will be presented by the Director of English, Language, Arts, Social Studies, and Ethnic Studies, Rich Moran. Welcome. Thank you, good evening. Uh, good evening, President Acosta, Dr. Contreras, uh, trustees, new members of cabinet. cabinet. Um, great to be here tonight. Um, I do have the pleasure of um, offering you the final um, report on the ELSB block grant. Um, there's our mission statement as it's been practiced, we're not reading it all, but um, so we'll forego that. But I do wanna hit these. Um, so district goal alignment, um, PVUSD is committed to providing a high quality education program that focuses on raising the overall academic achievement for all students. And goal two, through collaborative implement driven approach, PVSD will provide programs to support all students in achieving at grade level on California state standards and that achievement gaps are reduced. So that's kind of the focus, those are the goals um, that this grant were meant to hit. I'm holding my glasses because eventually I'm gonna need them. Um, you can see there, and you, this may be, since this is the final in three reports, you may be familiar with this information, but I did want to go over it. Um, the ELSB grant requires California Department of Ed to award funds to local education agencies with the 75 schools that have the highest percentage of students in grade three scoring at the lowest achievement level standard on state summative English language arts assessments. And then the goal of the grant, um, early literacy support block grant, is to develop and implement literacy instruction and support programs particularly focused on literacy in grades TK or K through three. So those are the big ones. Those are something you should be familiar with. Um, that's what we're looking to do. So there were three school sites involved. Um, I had the pleasure to come in towards the end of the grant, um, but got to be familiar with the school sites, the site leadership, and the programs that they were working with. So we have the MSD Eagles. Uh, any alumni? Okay. Uh, Calabasas and Radcliffe. So there are four categories. Um, we'll review the categories and then the action from the plan, um, review the SMART goals, and then revisions and any next steps. And actually the revisions, not a lot of revisions since this is the final report, but I think the next steps can be important as well. 
Um, so the four grant categories were access to high quality literacy teaching, uh, support for literacy learning, pupil supports, and family and community supports. This might be a much visually, um, but we wanted to get at the point that, you know, the goal is to use SMART goals, so we wanted to give you an idea uh, quickly so you can look through and get the idea that it's specific, it's measurable, it's attainable, relevant, time-bound, and equitable. Um, so we'll start with uh, some of the fun stuff. I'll calm down a little bit. I know I'm rambling. What you have in front of you are family literacy nights, and um, if you haven't been to a family literacy night, um, make it a practice to go to them. Um, they're one of the most fun evenings just to see families um, engaging in understanding what's happening at schools, getting good information from the school leaders, from the teachers, and getting a better understanding of what's happening at the school site in support of their students. Um, I want to give Mr. Berman and the Parent Engagement Network credit. Um, looking at the slide and folks in the grant, we've transitioned from just offering things to families because we know it's a good idea to do that and it's important to do that to um, making it a way for us to fully engage and really consider what we're offering, how we're offering it, and the impact it can have on families. So I'm really pleased um, to share that part of the grant. And I'll mention this a couple times tonight that this practice and some of the other practices that we saw in the grant are transferable and have transferred. But this was a big one. It doesn't only happen, as you all know, at these grant sites, but it's become a big practice for all of our grant for all of our sites, especially at elementary, is to really focus on getting our families to the school, um, and engaging them fully, and being really conscious of how we engage them and what we offer. Um, so we've transitioned from just having you on site as a victory to full engagement, getting input and getting your support. So as you can see, um, very successful and a big part of the grant. So our first SMART goal was simply to administer um, the universal screener and look at data analysis. So it said, um, we'll improve our TK through three collection of valid and predictable reliable data by administering um, our universal screener. So you can go to the next one. Um, we so administer dibbles three times a year, fall, winter, and spring, and again, done at all elementary sites. Um, we analyze those data, review those data, and progress monitor based on those data. So again, it's a part of the grant, but it's something that we're doing across elementary. Our second SMART goal, um, improve our skill in distributive practice. And really what that is is making sure that we understand what students need and giving it to them in a timely manner using the materials that we have. And these were the tools that we use. So we have an example of um, our Hegarty program, which really focuses on phonemic awareness. It's fantastic. Um, we have an example of an instructor or coach providing students what they need when they need it, which is an additional support to what they normally get as part of Tier 1, and then using uh, SIPs, our curriculum, as a model. Part 3, um, improve student, uh, student comprehension of instruction and using high-quality on grade-level complex text. Um, so goal 3 is where we'll kind of get into it. Um, and it says, as measured by um, NWEA MAP, Dibbles Adele Benchmark Informative Assessment. So tonight you'll see as we go to the next slide. Um, I'll get back to the high um, improved literacy instruction. So coming into the grant, I came in late um, because transition in this position. And one of the first things that I got to experience was the lesson study process. Again, completed at all three sites. And um, these are just images of it, but I have to say that the collaboration, the conversation, specific conversation teachers were having around instruction and the impact instruction had on their students was um, fantastic. It was pointed, it was very specific. Um, it wasn't always comfortable, but I thought it was the right thing to do and I thought our staff fully engaged in that process and our students benefited from it. So there's some trends that we can see. We've compiled some data Overall trends, um, we saw an increase in instructional efficacy over the life of the grant and improved outcomes for nearly all learners um, each year, as well as continued growth for cohorts. So we'll take a moment just to pause to look at that slide. So if we look at um, the slide there, you can see grades K through three that are um, illustrated. And looking at the Dibbles, if you look at year 2021 and go from 18% to 35 to 69, 
Um, those were the amount or the percentage of students that were at core or core plus, so they're at grade level. They're where we want them to be. So as you move across, we can see that instruction in K improved over time. And if you move in a diagonal manner, you can follow a cohort of kids. So you can also see there that at MSD, um, there was some improvement there from 18% to 23 to 40%. Uh, the green shows growth over three years, and the blue shows growth over the last two years. Um, we have some data from Calabasas um, showing some of the similar trends, and then data is from the next slide from Radcliffe. Next slide. Um, so the learnings, revisions, and next steps. Um, we've got the right curriculum. Um, we've got the right instruction. So what we're learning really is that we just need to refine our process. And that came in with um, the lesson study. Um, showed you a lot of numbers tonight. There's the numbers that we wanted you to see to understand where our progress is. Um, what's not up there is the anecdotal information from the staff and from the sites. And what we noticed, um, the level of collegiality, um, their willingness and ability to collaborate with each other, to look at curriculum with each other, to ask each other the challenging questions, and to move forward for the sake of students was something that we will continue. So we learned a lot from this grant about how to support sites, how to support instruction, um, how to use the materials. So it will help us provide um, a pretty good foundation for as uh, the rest of the work that we continue over the next three years. That's what I have. Thank you, Ms. Moran. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. And I'll remind the board this is a, a report and discussion item, not an action item this evening. Any deliberation from the board? Trustee Bolano Scow. Yes, thank you for this presentation. Um, I guess um, so, we're, how is this? Uh, these programs, how are they implemented? Uh, I know those three elementary schools, some are, have different approaches to bilingual education. Mm -hmm. and we're talking about English literacy, right? Specifically. So I guess my two part question is how is that specific? How is this grant, how is it implemented at the different school sites? And then generally, what are, do we have some data and evidence about? In learning to read in English, uh, are some school sites performing better with their different programs? Can we say this program has more success, this program has different success? How, can, we, can we say that yet? If we stick to the grant sites, um, you have one dual language school there, MSD. Um, the programs that we have are offered in both English and Spanish. So the focus of the grant was to hire a coach, hire a literacy coach. And the coach's um, role was meant to support the site um, be part of the lesson study, support teachers in implementing curriculum with fidelity. So um, the success that we can see, MSD was a dual language school, they did see success, but I don't yet think we have uh, the data to parse out yet um, which types of schools had greater success. And one of the variables will always be um, who's the coach, what's the level of collaboration, um, so those are things that we're hoping we can refine as we look to grants in the future, is really get a better understanding of what role the coach has, how can we use those coach, coaches to support staff in implementing the curriculum that they have available to build either um, monolingual or biliterate citizens, biliterate students. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time, sorry. I can't breathe right now. <laughs> this is not my personality, but I hear it. No, no. Great question, though. Thank you. Thank, yeah, I've been filling up my water bottle. I've been kind of dehydrated. Oh my gosh! Uh, so yeah, it's the, it's the bigger question, and is we, we be, bilingual education has been a big part of this district. The discussion, the desire of certain school, school sites to have yeah. dual immersion programs. Some Calabas, is my understanding, is not wanting to yeah. go that route. And so I'm just be curious going forward. Uh, I can say this. Yeah. Um, because, and I'll be presenting to you all, hopefully with less stuttering, um, in the future. But our next grant is our Literacy Coach Grant. It's something that we've already been working on, so I'll share a presentation with the board. Um, but what I can say about that is our work with the coaches, our work with curriculum, because we will have dual language sites and SEI sites, I think we'll have the opportunity to refine instruction and to really parse out what works for all of our learners. 
And I think that might be a better time to really see um, what our practice does, what our coaches do, and what our staff do with our current curriculum, because I think we have the curriculum in place. We'll have a number of dual language schools. And they're not all exactly the same in terms of their programming, but I think we'll have a better opportunity to have a, a better understanding of the connection between our actions, our professional learning, and our development, and what impact that has on all of our kids. And then I think we can start digging in. Um, one of the other variables would be the difference in the type of dual language program you have and what um, opportunities that presents and maybe what challenges that might present um, for what could be a school within a school. But I think we'll have a better opportunity to look at what our curriculum is doing, all of our curriculum, TK through three, for foundational literacy as we move through like the next three years. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scow. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Thank sure. you. We look forward to your next participation. <laughs> great job tonight, too. Oh, thank you. I, I, I feel that. <laughs> but thank you for your graciousness. It's the end of a fiscal year. What can you say? <laughs> just thank you again. The, I've been doing it all night. Let's just blame it on that, okay? Thank you again. <laughs> thank you. Now moving to item 12.2, the 2023-24 Local Performance Indicator Reflection Report. And this report will be presented by our superintendent of PBUSD Schools, Dr. Contreras. Good evening, and I guess we forward advanced slides. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so this is the 2023-24 local indicator report. To go on to the next slide, and this aligns with our collective why, which is our PVUSD mission, and the mission of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is to educate, support, and to support learners in reaching their highest potential. We prepare students to pursue successful features, futures and to make positive contributions to the community and global society. Next slide. This aligns with our goal two, which is sound operational oversight. And the reason why we bring this forward is this is a accountability measure that we have to do um, as part of our local control funding formula. Uh, we have a state board of education adopted tool that we use for our self-reflection and it helps us to measure our progress in the areas that are that we um, report to the state on the dashboard about our locally collected data. There are five areas that we report on and those are basic conditions at school, implementation of our state standards, our parent engagement, school climate, and access to a broad course of study. For priority number one, which is our basic services, the three things we look at are do we have our teachers appropriately assigned teaching within their credentialed area and teaching the correct course content for that credentialed area, and we do have 100% of our teachers appropriately assigned. Uh, do our students all have access to standards aligned instructional materials? So that's our board adopted curriculum and all of our students have 100% of what they need through their curriculum. Um, and then do we have safe, clean and functional school facilities. You'll note this is an area where we did uh, decrease and I think that's one of the reasons why we um, are going forward to seek a bond is to help with those facilities. Our priority number two is the implementation of our state academic standards. This measures our progress in providing professional development for teachers with standards and curriculum. So that's in alignment with the presentation you just heard by Mr. Moran. Also are our instructional materials aligned with those state standards. So is our board adopted curriculum uh, meeting the needs of the state standards? Do we have policies and programs to support our staff in identifying areas of need? So that would be what happens when we um, have needs that the that teachers and staff um, need to have met. And then are we implementing our CTE, our health education, physical education, visual and performing arts, and world languages according to the state standards? And then what is our progress with our administrators and teachers identifying their professional development needs and are we meeting those needs and what do the administrators actually say through survey data and what do teachers say? Uh, in this area, we ranked at least in each category full implementation of all of our subsections. 
For priority three, this is our parent and family engagement. It's actually an area of strength for our district. We have great site family engagement plans. Our parent involvement programs are robust and meet the needs of our parents, and we have supportive resources uh, within our district, such as the Student Wellness Center um, and Family Wellness Center that you approved through the consent agenda earlier this evening. Um, a focus area of improvement, though, continues to be language accessibility in engaging our underrepresented families. So it's an area to look at going forward. And then also our targeted outreach to underrepresented groups. Priority six is our school climate. So what is our student perception? of school safety and connectedness. So some of the strengths are the respect for um, different backgrounds and diversity. Students report that they generally feel challenged academically and they indicate that the curriculum is perceived as rigorous. And many students report feeling a sense of belonging in their school environment. Some areas for growth that we see within school climate are improved student engagement, which is where Jen Bruno's programs come in to support, um, strengthening relationships between students and their teachers, a school culture that is more supportive and respectful, and more equitable discipline practices, as well as targeted support to ensure inclusivity and equity of non-binary students. Priority seven is access to a broad course of study. So it's that students have access to board approved and standards aligned course materials as well as visual and performing arts and physical education. And we meet those criteria. All middle schools have visual and performing arts classes. All of our high school course subject courses are UC and A3, AG approved, which is outstanding. And our numerous career and technical education classes with multiple CTE pathways um, are at all of our high schools. Uh, additionally, we do provide and offer an increased number of advanced placement classes for our high school students to participate in. So our next steps is we collect this information using the State Board of Education adopted tool for helping us to self-reflect. And then we upload these local indicator um, information to our California dashboard so that it's viewable by the public. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. OK, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? And I'll remind the board this is a report and discussion item. And thank you, Dr. Contreras, for the report. Trustee Bolano scout Thank you. Just a question, because um, some of these themes and topics remind me of the Youth Truth, Youth Truth Survey presentation, which I felt was very, very comprehensive. Did we collect? And I understand this is a different kind of requirement, but I'm just. Can you make a comparison? No, this on is one of those. That is one of the tools we use to collect oh, that data. Oh, oh okay, yeah. okay, great, 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 great. Good I, catch. Good pickup. Yeah, and I, <laughs> and I apologize for saying it now, but I've before when you were transitioned there, I have heard of special education teachers not getting curriculum uh, in t in a timely fashion. Um, and I'll bring that to your attention privately, Dr. Kuna, but I did it. I, Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, That's yeah. definitely something we do like to hear things, those kinds of stories so that we could keep our eye on it and do better. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Bolano scout Anyone else? No. No. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Sorry. All right. Seeing um, nothing else from anyone, we, the board does need to reconvene to closed session. So I will now adjourn the board back to closed session, and the board will reconvene to public session to report out of closed session. Reconvene us back to public session at 1027 p.m. And we have items to report out of closed session. All right. As of tonight's meeting, uh, I have motion number one, closed session item 2.2. .2. So I move to approve the certificate of personnel report as presented by district administration on June 26, 2024. 
with 32 and 27 additional action items. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That'll carry 601. All right, motion number two, closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on June 26, 2024 with four and one additional action items. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That'll carry 601. All right, closed session item 2.7. Under closed session agenda item 2.7, Board of Trustees voted 601 to reject a liability claim. Closed session item, pardon me, 2.8, regarding resolution 232448. The board approved the non reelection of one FTE certificated probationary employee number 10. Zero eight five. Oh, the motion and the motion carried six zero one. I have a couple of announcements this evening. Uh, announcement number one: Paro Valley Unified School District pleased to announce the selection of Mr. Ivan or Ivan Alcarez as the new executive director of student service or support services. Mr. Alcarez has been serving students of Paro Valley since 2013 as the intervention counselor before becoming an assistant principal of Watsonville High. He has served as principal of Rolling Hills since 2019 and most recently as the director of student services here at PVUSD. Mr. Alcarez is a local resident of Watsonville and former student of PVUSD. He obtained his BA in business management economics from UCSC, his master's in education and counseling students personnel, master's of education and administration and supervision, and his doctorate in educational leadership. Proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to his new administrative role. Uh, announcement number two, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Jennifer Littleton Bruno as the new executive director of Expanded Learning. Jennifer has been serving students since 1999 as an after-school program, academic coach and teacher leader, an after-school coordinator as the Extended Learning Program TOSA, and most recently as the Director of Expanded Learning. She obtained her bachelor's degree in liberal studies from San Francisco State and her multiple subject teaching credential from Fresno State. She also holds an administrative credential opt obtained from school leaders licensure. Ms. Littleton Bruno brings a wealth of experience relating to after school programs and extended learning. These experiences will serve her well in her new role as you heard her presentation this evening. Congratulations, Jennifer and Ivan. Thank you, Trustee Vice President Soto. And um, our next meeting is our regular board meeting on July 24th, 2024 here in the city council chambers. See you all then, have a wonderful summer and I will adjourn this meeting at 10.30 p.m. Oh. 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 Oh.